Penny and um, and Caitlin will pop in when they, they get here. So uh, good evening and welcome to the uh, Cape Elizabeth Town Council workshop for Monday, March 15th. Uh, this is the first of our budget workshops. We're, um, so we're gonna be taking a look through um, the budget workshop tonight. Uh, tonight we're looking at um, a number of accounts relating to admin, assessing and codes, the library, public safety and human services. Um, the second workshop on Thursday, which will also begin at six o'clock, we'll be looking at public works, facilities, uh, community services, Fort Williams, Portland Headlight, capital improvement plan, special revenue funds, and also reviewing our fee schedule. Um, and then uh, just to go through the rest of the uh, workshop meeting for the public, any members of the public who are watching, uh, we'll also have on Monday, April 26th, a finance committee meeting with the school board to present their budget, uh, the school school board's budget. Um, they have a series of workshops underway, and unfortunately, I don't have the dates in front of me right at the moment. Um, and then uh, we have a wrap-up meeting scheduled for April 27th, if that's needed, um, with a scheduled public hearing on May 3rd and a vote of the council at our regular meeting on May 10th. Um, so that's our, that's our schedule um, of review uh, for, for the budget meetings this year. Um, I don't know if any counselors had any questions on that schedule or if we should just dive right into Matt's overview. Great, take it away, Matt. Yep. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, good evening, everyone, and uh, thank you uh, for the opportunity to come out this evening and uh, for working with the six o'clock start time. Uh, hopefully we can uh, be efficient with the use of your time and uh, provide the information that you were looking for this evening. Or we'll also take notes as we go along if there's additional follow-up information that we're obviously happy to provide. Uh, I'd like to start off by thanking uh, all the department heads who did an exemplary job this year uh, putting together their information regarding this year's budget. Uh, met with each of them to discuss them, uh, follow up with questions, uh, made adjustments as we went forward and uh, very proud to bring forward our product uh, for your review. I'd like to take uh, the opportunity to also thank John Quartararo. He did a great job when it came to uh, organizing the budget as far as uh, getting the information together, organizing by cost centers, which we hope that you will find that more of a functional document for you as you go through. Uh, especially in the capital side, I think there was a, there was a significant change there where you can see that. And uh, hopefully as we get into that discussion, we'll make make sense as to how it's organized, but it's Yeoman's work to enter into all that data and information, as well as to work with the manager to make changes as they come on a daily, sometimes hourly basis. So a uh, special thanks to John for his hard work when it came to the, all of his work regarding the budget, as well as my assistant manager, Deborah Lane, who uh, <laughs> helps me in more ways than I could ever list. And uh, well, if I tried to start that list, uh, it would be impossible. But you don't even show on my screen. So, what's that, Chief? Trying to help the police chief. <laughs> Tell him I will promote him. Oh my goodness. And thanks to Chief <laughs> Chief Gleason for the assist on that. Um, moving on. Uh, you'll notice that this format this year is, is a bit different. So we did have some reorganizations that took place this spring where the cost centers were changed uh, specific to, uh, to public works and the fort and the cost centers that were arranged there and were topic of discussion two months ago with you know, at the council level. So the total combined municipal and community services budget for this year is 16, uh, sorry, $16,870,373. This is offset by revenues from all sources in the amount of $8,853,472. And the amount to be collected from property taxes is proposed to be $7,016,901. As proposed, this budget will provide a net to tax increase of 3.76%. And then, as you may recall, last year's budget had its significant cha challenges and changes, uh, ultimately resulted in a decrease to the municipal rate by 3.46%. So for a two-year average, the increase to the taxpayers, uh, at least on the municipal side, will be 0.15 of a percent uh, of an increase over the two-year average. Now, looking at this year's budget, 54.4% of the budget is 
related to personnel expenses, and this includes for this year a 2% wage increase. The budget contains con significant capital item purchases in line with the planned capital improvement plan. Uh, of highlights for that would be the Willowbrook culvert replacement, Kettle Cove Crescent Beach access replacement or improvement, planning and engineering for improvements to Shore Road, and where available, the town is also pursuing grant funding to where there may be a municipal match. So we are trying to pursue funds from all locations that we can that will help offset project costs. Specifically for grant funding for Willowbrook, we're currently in process for an MPI grant for half of the expense for shore road planning and anticipated that uh, we're, we're looking for grant funding for Kettle Cove Crescent Beach access. One of the larger ticket items on the capital side would be the replacement of the Public Works Department loader and backhoe replacement, which is has reached or is quickly reaching the end of its economic and useful life. The capital plan also has a planning engineering construction for new parking area at the Spurwink Schoolhouse building in the amount of $100,000. This is an important uh, step forward as we consider uh, improving and uh, the Spurring Schoolhouse uh, for the eventual home for the Historical Society, but without the parking in place that any f future use of that building will have to uh, be on hold until that can be supplied. Uh, so that was a significant step forward in that direction. Capital plan re re includes the replacement of engine two, which is a 1999 vehicle reaching the end of its useful and economic life. And uh, the two large ticket, or many of the large ticket asset items that we have, will be pursuing a lease purchase option that will allow us to finance it over five years at what we're looking at as very low rates. And the, and the taxpayers and residents of the town will be able to enjoy the benefits of those while paying for their use at the same time, not, not significantly impacting the tax rate. Now, offsetting these increases. Uh, is used in the un of the unassigned fund balance in the amount of a million dollars, and this will be used toward capital improvements and against the annual operating expenses. This will also lower the current amount of unassigned funds, but keep the level in line with our current policy. There's also additional funding applied from the infrastructure fund to offset capital expenses of $205,000. Now, revenues from other sources are also projected to have net increase. Residents have been buying newer vehicles, and this year we anticipate, uh, due to an, an improved climate for excise taxes, an increase of 425,000 more than the current year, which was adjusted significantly downward last year as a result of the pandemic. Uh, however, we found that uh, our original estimates were, were, were very conservative to the benefit of the town, but at the same time, we find that as we're coming out of this, those numbers should track more closely to reality or to what our current trends have shown. Community services, you'll notice that their revenues have been adjusted. This is in relationship to the, the current climate for uh, reduced programming that, that we found as well as uh, reduced numbers. As we come out of this, we, we're, we're hopeful that those numbers will rebound. Uh, we did uh, through a great creative uh, effort by the by staff last summer. Uh, we were one of the very few communities that actually did have a Cape summer, have a summer program that was uh, well regarded by the community. And I think they were quite grateful that it could take place. The kids had a blast and we were blessed by a dry summer. So uh, the two days we had threats of rain that happened after the kids were dismissed for the day, thankfully. But we'll also notice that in uh, Richard's pool fees as well. That as we come out of this, we'll come back to more traditional numbers, but as we get to greater capacity limits. Revenue for pay and display parking at Fort Williams is anticipated to increase this year from last year's reduced number. Uh, what we've found this year so far through the month of uh, January and February, we've had 30,000 visits to the fort uh, for traffic counts. And those are legitimate numbers provided by a traffic study performed by Darren Estes of the police department. Uh, we're also adding in April and half of November uh, by council order and the recommendation by the Fort Williams Park Committee. Uh, that should result in a significant increase of that. So we're looking at $380,000 in year three of that, of that program. I think that uh, ties up where I'm at as far as, a, uh, as an introduction to the budget. And, uh, but I look forward to working with the council going through this. And again, a huge debt of gratitude to our department heads for their excellent work and, and, and working with me to get this moving forward. And I'd be happy to explore any questions that you have as we go through the process. So thank you, Mr. Chairman.
Great, thanks, Matt. Um, I'll pause and see if there's any questions from the council for for uh, the town manager. Uh, Matt, I had one general question, uh, kind of really just for my own edification. Um, uh, you mentioned a number of, of grants that uh, the town is either applying for or um, expects to receive to offset some of the projected expenses this year. Um, I was just wondering if you could help walk me through how those show up um, in terms of the revenue lines or does, uh, like how, do, how, do, how, do, how are those, do those expected grant funds show up in the budget? Yes, uh, John, John can, a can answer this more, but, but I believe it will show them as, uh, as part of our revenue. Okay. Thank you. Um, they do show up as revenue in the, in the budget uh, as a partial offset to the expenses being planned. If you go, uh, I don't see the pages are fully, uh, if you go to what's listed as page seven of 67, it's administrative working revenue budget. Mm -hmm. And if you go into the lower middle, there's a section called capital grants funding. Okay. Great, thank you. Okay. Okay, so that shows the uh, grants that we're anticipating receiving uh, revenues through. And then if those were to fall through, then the expenses would not be made unless there was a replacement from undesignated fund balance. Okay. And, and do those roll up into the pro forma somewhere, John? Yes, they're, they're part of the uh, revenue line. Just the general municipal revenue? Yes. Okay. Thank you. That was kind of, that was more what I was wondering. I'm sorry. I didn't ask more clearly. And um, that'll be on page, page 13 of our, of our, of our regular document as you go through. Great. Um, thank you. Um, other questions, Valerie? Well, I, I'm curious along those same lines, uh, because we do have, it sounds like some proposals out there for grants and we're waiting for some matching municipal grant funds. Uh, if those do come in next year, they'll go ahead and be put into this budget or they will be passed along for the following year. How does that work, John? If, if those, the, the one that I know of that is in process would be the Willowbrook. It's um, water conservation um, for about $343,000. Um, at the time that we get a final award and do a contract, I would bring it forward to the council to accept it. It's already been put into the budget and the offsetting expenditures will have already been approved. So your next step would be to accept the funds and it would be ready to go at that point. Okay. If, if the grant were denied and funding was not available, then uh, decisions would have to be made about another revenue stream or to put the project on hold. Okay. And then I, I had one other question about the CARES Act. Um, will we be receiving federal money? Do you know? And um, how does that get allocated? Sure. Uh, that, that's a great question. And uh, it's almost, you could call it the million dollar question because uh, what we've seen uh, last week, I had a meeting with uh, the Southern Maine managers and Steve Gove of Maine Municipal was there as well. Uh, there, there are some preliminary estimates out there. Uh, they haven't come forward with what the numbers uh, actually will be. They've, I've just seen percentage breakdown that they've had, uh, but we do anticipate receiving funds and we'll, that picture will become clearer as the spring goes forward. Uh, that would be booked in this year for revenue as a, as a revenue that would come in. Uh, but th there are many other items of that that it will be a two year uh, part of a two year plus or minus uh, funding uh, system. And that would be for, uh, we anticipate that for infrastructure uh, projects that may be shovel ready or shovel worthy. Uh, so we're anticipating those, that funding to come forward. That's still a moving landscape. Sorry, my stand up desk uh, moved. Um, but, that's, but that's a big area. We will, I'll have better information as that does develop. Right now we've been looking at uh, the state is receiving in the billions uh, or 1.2 billion, I think is the number that I've seen uh, 
and then they've broken that down by county, by uh, metropolitan area, and then by uh, non non metropolitan. So uh, the 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 spreadsheet that I saw show us at like 0.115, uh, roughly. You know, I have a feeling it's going to be somewhere between 800,000 to a million dollars is what the town should anticipate to receive for revenue. But uh, let's just say I, I haven't I haven't made plans for that money uh, yet until the funds come into the house. <laughs> Oh, that's great. I'm just curious if any of it's like earmarked for certain departments, but you probably don't even know yet. It's just um, coming generally to the municipalities or is, okay, it, it is, for, uh, it is for revenue offsetting uh, revenues that we did not receive. So, uh, for instance, what, what we'd be looking at there would be our community community services size for revenue that we didn't receive there from uh, some of the programming. You think about uh, at the at Fort Williams Park revenues that we didn't realize from uh, from no from not having any uh, tour bus traffic or uh, or uh, trolley traffic. So there are numbers there that uh, that could backfill uh, as well. I think that's one of the elements of it was to offset uh, revenues that were not that were anticipated but yet not received. You're welcome, Matt. Um, one of the things that we know, well, we assume, or it's been stated, is um, there's a lot around uh, infrastructure in that 1.9 trillion. So might um, there be some dollars flowing uh, from that direction that would be targeted toward uh, more of uh, infrastructure, roads, those kind of things. And there's also, I think I mentioned it to you today, there's also the arts libraries, um, uh, those types of dollars that are inside that uh, 1.9 as well. So there might be, I guess we just keep that on the radar. Uh, yes, uh, Councilor Jordan, to your point, uh, and thank you for that. Uh, one of the items that we had uh, earlier in the budget season had thought about doing was the Kettle Cove drainage project. Uh, that we had on last year, uh, we had a conversation with our associates at the Portland Water District, and it found that the water line out in that section of town uh, was installed. And uh, Jay Reynolds could could correct me on Thursday if I'm wrong here, but it's either 1919 or 1929. Uh, fairly old water line, uh, to say the least. So uh, they have a high uh, level of interest in in combining with us on that project. Uh, we have that just about shovel ready. Uh, we've done a lot of the engineering, we have that work completed. But if we can combine with them, we'll find, you know, there's always savings when you have your friends join up with a project like that, similar to Hillway and Scott Dyer Road with the water district two years ago. Uh, so if we can do that, that would be great. They do not have funding in this year's budget allocated for that. However, if infrastructure money, such as what Councilor Jordan was referencing comes forward, and that could expedite the process. Uh, that would be something that we we are ready to go with. Uh, another thought would be, uh, you noticed in this year, we do have planning and engineering for shore roads uh, for the work on shore road over the next year to move that forward uh, in the next two to three years. Uh, if we can find something like along those lines that could help us you know, for next year, we would try to get in line for that for this year uh, as well. Uh, so any area that we can find uh, where we have there's always projects, I guess, out there, and if there is something that we can that we can actualize through through stimulus funds, we are going to be ready to pounce when it comes to that. And then with the spurring school, if yeah, if there's a if there's a historical or arts approach that we could find to help us offset the renovations there in conjunction with the the paving work that needs to take place and walk them through the planning process to get the historical society there with the approvals. Uh, will be ready to and poison ready to move in that direction too. All right. Thank you. Um, I, I think we'll have some opportunity to dig into more specific questions as we move along. Um, I would just suggest maybe uh, the next item on our moving along to our next item on our agenda, which is an opportunity for public comment. I see we currently have five folks in the attendees um, area, and I will just open it up to see if anyone has any any uh, public comment to offer at this time. Uh, 
All right, seeing none, um, I'm going to turn it over to Matt for a review of the 110 budget lines for um, administration. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, as you notice, this is the administration budget. This in includes myself, uh, John, John Q, uh, Deborah as the assistant town manager, and uh, the, the agents in the tax collection department, that would be our deputy town clerk, a municipal agent, and our, and our two RV agents. Uh, so we have in here the, uh, the salaries and benefits, for, uh, sorry, the salaries for those for all those positions combined. You notice there's a net 2% change there. Uh, there is, you'll probably notice there isn't a great deal of changes when it comes to our operational budget. Uh, a few areas that we do have uh, on this is, you know, we do have our telephone. This is the telephone service for all of the all of the municipal municipal billing. Uh, our printing and advertising. This would be for uh, the different mailers that do have to go out from from our office on an on an annual basis. Uh, all of our postage postage is anticipated to increase this year, uh, so about halfway through. But we feel this number uh, addresses that. Uh, and then travel, this would be uh, the allowance for my uh, vehicle on an annual basis in traveling. Um, part, of, part of it's partially uh, part of my contract, uh, but it also offsets any changes that I have to do for, for travel related to the position. Uh, dues and memberships, these would be for uh, professional organizations. Uh, part of these are part of my contract as well, but also uh, for other, other um, associations that uh, perhaps Deborah may be in, or John, if he so pursues it. Uh, training and conferences this year, uh, last year, well, fiscal year 20 was that uh, what you would call a year for travel. We're not sure if this will as well, um, but we flat funded flat funded that that side of it, uh, anticipating that it may have to we may be able to get more live training this year versus virtual. Uh, that is, I guess you could say, an aspirational uh, statement at this point in time, but hopeful. And as well as our, our training, the training budget that we do have, I uh, use that for myself as well as any other staff members. For instance, this year, we've, we've done a lot of this with diversity training and inclusion training that uh, has been made available through the MMA, uh, as well as uh, uh, department heads when they would like to grab some training. I uh, will use that line there. Uh, professional services. Uh, sorry, just need to flip my page. This is for deed and filing fees or miscellaneous studies. As you know, during the course of the year, we will run into uh, subject matters that the council may want to look into further. Uh, so we can use that for that type of an example. And then we do have our internet uh, online charges for our Google. Uh, basically, I, in my budget, we will also maintain or keep the, uh, the, the technology allocation will be found through there. So it'll be the internet online, cha online charges computer maintenance, uh, those two areas that we do have there, and technology equipment, so which is further down. Uh, and that would be across all departments uh, for providing when they do need to have a replacement for a computer or other um, technological approaches that were taken within, within the office. And then we also do have uh, general assistance. We do have our contract uh, administrator, and that was that's our contract we have through the Opportunity Alliance, that, uh, that position, uh, meets with uh, general assistant applicants on a weekly basis uh, to go through their uh, their requests uh, and and pursue and uh, and provide the information that they need and process their their GA applications. And then we do have our bank fees, which includes the courier uh, work, where we are using uh, a courier to to pick up instead of having different departments go to the bank on a daily basis. Now they do come. Uh, and pick up the cash as we've discussed a bit during the audit audit process. We're looking to expand that some with uh, with a, with a, uh, with the fort this year as well, uh, further than what they were already using. Uh, and let's see, we do not have COVID supplies this year. I'm firmly knocking on wood, uh, but we do not anticipate further expenditures when it comes to that for this year. Uh, when we do have school provided tech services, uh, that is um, for this year. What we're looking at, they're having a reorganization when it comes to uh, the provision of technological services. This is a position that we used to uh, share with the school, uh, with the technology director. They're going in a different direction with an, uh, with, uh, an IT uh, uh, integrator uh, position, I believe is what they're calling that, uh, to help on the curriculum side. Uh, this still provides for tech services that we receive from uh, three gentlemen who do 
that work across both the school and the town's uh, computer side. Uh, but also we have uh, an estimate of $40,000 in this year's budget for cybersecurity software. Uh, we're looking to have that provided by an outside uh, outside provider. We've met so far with three different providers, uh, maybe four at this point in time, but the numbers have been tracking quite close to that. Uh, we're looking to have that uh, deployed for, for July 1. Right now we're test driving uh, uh, one service to see how that may work, but they should be in that range. Uh, from the estimates, cost estimates we've received so far. And let's see, then we do have, yeah, as I referred to technology uh, equipment replacements, that's a, that's an ongoing ongoing expense that we have uh, for re routine and, um, and planned replacement for, for, for end units, as well as uh, unanticipated replacements that need to take place during the course of the year. But I'd be happy to take any questions. I think that wraps up the, the 110 side of it. Great, Valerie. Um, I have a question I'm gonna direct towards uh, to John Q. And I know I asked this last year and I'm just curious if um, it's streamlined a little bit, um, how the school provided tech services are calculated. I just see that um, we have a tiny increase in the number, but I'd like to know um, how that's calculated. I don't have an answer for you. <clears throat> The last numbers that I saw were put together by Catherine Mesmer in 2017. We have not been able to find anything that backs up the allocation. I have tried working with the school department on <clears throat> tracing numbers and figuring out a pattern on the go forward, and it has not worked out. In October of 2019, the Joint School Board and uh, Council Committee asked us to take a look at it, and it has not worked very well at all. So I don't have an answer for you. When we tried to get information about the technology, what we were told was their database is flawed and is not reliable. So it, it's a number that was made up uh, four years ago and just continues to carry forward. All right. Um, Matt, yes, is Deborah, there if, I, if I can, if I can provide uh, further detail on that as well. With this uh, number that we have this year, um, the 40,000 of that is to go towards uh, the cybersecurity with 10,000 allocated towards uh, technology services. Uh, looking at the number of uh, computer units that they had, I think the school had roughly uh, 300 employees that they have that, that they're responsible for, plus the students, which that, that you know, there's roughly 1,200 students, but you figure at, uh, at I think, 75% that puts it at about 900 uh, for the year, roughly 1,200 um, units that they have on their side that they're responsible for helping with versus the town side where we have roughly 100 units that they work with. Uh, so what we ended up doing on that was, and I'll, I'll tell you the 10,000 10, I have in for services is, is, is an estimate based on the three uh, gentlemen who do that work for us against the, uh, the overall number and versus the number of tech tickets. As John said, he's right on the money uh, as far as uh, being able to, to break out the number of tech tickets and the volume. Uh, talking with uh, Noel uh, Harif, who's the IT director currently, uh, looking at the number that we have, we're roughly what one to you know a, a tenth of what of what they have, or a little bit less than ten percent of the overall units. Uh, we're not a heavy user, but uh, that was that was that was the best estimate that that I thought made sense versus the fifty thousand basically we were paying before. Okay, um, yeah, that it just doesn't seem like it's really. Um put together very well, because if we had a contractor, we'd have a contract and we'd know what, um, what we're paying for and how many hours we're getting. Uh, and I would venture to guess that th their 300 is a much heavier user than our 100. So um, I'd really love to see something to where uh, we have somebody that comes over one day a week for eight hours, what it, whatever it is, to where it's calculated a little bit better because I noticed that there's this calculation 
um, through quite a few of our um, budgets. So, yeah, yeah on, the, on the facility side, uh, you know, I've, I've spoken with Perry. I know John has as well. I spoke with him again last week uh, and said, hey, you know, we need to have this broken down by position, at least by the amount of hours and how you have that allocated. I said, so be prepared for that conversation. Okay, great. Jamie, I see your hand up. Uh, Valerie, did, I just want to make sure your question got addressed. Okay, Jamie. Yeah, I, I wanted to follow up on this as well. Um, I, this at, after we um, were first discussing the, you know, the school uh, department's decision to, um, you know, re envision how they wanted to deliver this service. It, it got me thinking a little bit more about, and, and you know, some of you have all heard me. Um, you know, seek out opportunities for um, uh, either municipal collaboration or some other sort of, you know, regional shared service model and things like that. Th this strikes me as a, a, a really strong area of opportunity for that, Matt. And I, I know that we're, what we're going to be challenged by is that we're, we're <clears throat> because of the nature of the school department's decision, we're, we're going to have to kind of move quickly to come up with a replacement. So, that you know, time isn't necessarily on our side, but whether it's um, uh, you know an outsourced, even cloud service model, um, where you know I know that there's a lot of providers, for example, that provide outsourced cloud service models for you know for IT help desk type of service. So the majority of things like oh I you know I need a password reset or I've got to do this you know some fairly mundane level one tasks and things like that. And so I don't know if that's something that we could explore a little bit more and then maybe just rely on some, you know, whomever is on the school side if, for the limited hardware things that we might have to deal with. Um, you know, oh, I need to get a replacement, you know, um, computer or iPad or something like that. But I don't know, it just, it just seems like there's an opportunity for us to think differently about this one and whether it's an outside, you know, rather than necessarily hiring a one-to-one a -one replacement for, for the role, so. Yeah, and, uh, and I do not have uh, in my budget a uh, proposal to replace uh, Noel as a one-to-one -one replacement. The thought is to use the current model that we have with the three gentlemen, uh, you know, Matthew, Jason, and uh, Connor to do our tech services that we do have. And a lot of what we do have is already outside of the building. Northern Data, which is one of our larger software uh, providers, is they provide us as that part of their service to manage. and and maintain what their uh, how their software works for us. And that's for us, it's, you know, it's our finance, it's our assessing, uh, our online billing and things along those lines that they manage. And so that that's fairly strong. Then you've got, you know, then you've got the, the window suite that that comes in. But uh, ultimately what we're trying to do is, is go on. I mean, the school is okay. And speaking with Donna, providing the same level of service that we've had on the tech side of it. Uh, and we're looking at a heck of a lot less than what we have contributed in the past as well. Um, I venture guess that if we went outside and hired a firm to provide that it, uh, as redundant to what we're getting from the uh, from you know Matthew and and Jason and Connor, uh, we'd pay a far cry greater than ten thousand dollars for an annual service, or at least if we're doing it on a per person or per call basis. Yeah, and so it, you know cost and and. It, is one thing with these things as always. I, I also just think about, you know, opportunity for, um, you know, perhaps improvement in service, but through it through a different service delivery model. I guess that's that's the point I'm trying to make. So, yeah. um, anyway, I, I, you know, if if if, um, if if you're comfortable with, you know, making sure that that our needs are covered, that's that's fine. I, I think going forward, I'd love to see this explored a little bit more, um, whether it's this budget year or not for, you know, either tag teaming with some other towns or, um, you know, some other regionally cooperative model for that. So. Yeah, no, I, 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 I'd like to see how we, how we make out this first year and then probably reevaluate it afterwards. Cause I do have some concern that, you know, I don't want us to be underserved, uh, you know, speaking with Donna and speaking with the, the tech group that we do have, they think that they, they're able to maintain that uh, level of service that we do have. The one area I was concerned about was, you know, long-term capital planning for replacement of hardware and having someone who's actually gonna be responsible for, for paying attention to that. That 
that that has kept me up at night a couple of different times, to be frank, because uh, Noel's done a great job uh, shepherding that over over the course of it. And the, and I also wonder if the school at the end of the year may find that that's a need that they have, uh, and then they come back to it as well. And and we could. Uh, so I'll be anxious to see where that that goes after year one. Bless you. So, so, um, so what I'm I'm hearing is because I'm going back to Valerie's point, we don't we don't know what services we're getting. But when I hear that we got software support with the vendors for who we purchase software, it sounds to me like the school's providing network hardware and troubleshooting for um, any of the issues that might be a result of network or hardware. Um, and the piece that they're moving away from is um, maintaining an installation and upgrading of hardware. I think they're, they're, they're getting away from having an IT director period. Uh, and they feel that basically having the three, uh, you know, the three gentlemen who do that work or three people that do that work uh, in a sense, <laughs> I draw them to the equivalent of saying that there are there are best mechanics. Uh, they keep so everything. So they're, they're, they're you know. network and hardware people. They aren't yeah. uh, supporting um, anything beyond an operating system and network and um, any hardware issues you might have. Yeah, yeah they keep the machine. So that's well. what we're paying for. Yep. Yeah. So that I'm back to Valerie's point. Contract. What are the services being provided? What's the cost? Because. Um, you may be able to shop that for a better, for a, a, dif a different uh, type of deal. So, but I think what we need to guard against is moving away from a um, network and hardware that is uh, integrated across the town because uh, we don't want two separate worlds because that then becomes uh, more costly. So, so what do we have and um, what are we paying for? Back to Valerie's point. Yeah, they, I mean, they do. I mean, we do share many different things still. I mean, they're, the school and the town still are following the one town concept when it comes to that, to that side of it, because they do have the same software that we do from, a, from the financial standpoint as well. So their business office pays their bills and, and you know, invoices the same way that we do, or actually we're combined with them on that side of it. And um, we may be getting a fabulous deal. It sounds like we are getting uh, a good deal, but I think it's important that it's transparent, that we know what we're paying for and it's very transparent. Yeah, Matt, I wonder if that's something that we could follow up with in our joint meetings with the school finance folks, You know, especially looking at the um, transition in superintendent and the transition in IT director. It seems like it may be an opportunity to just put in writing um, a little bit more detail around what the town is is getting for the ten thousand dollars that we're contributing toward that position. Oh sure, no, that's fine. I think that's a good good avenue for that conversation again. Okay, and I'd like a little bit. I, I think we probably are ready to move on to the one twenties, unless there's um, other questions about this. But I would um, like a little bit more information at some point on the um, contracted um, IT security services as well. Yep. Yep. Uh, as I said, yeah, we've, we've spoken with three, uh, I think, four different vendors so far, and and got some pretty decent proposals from them. But before we go further, I felt it was more important to to hear where the council, you know, quite frankly, when the bu budget gets approved, to make sure that the number that we did populate that with was was at or uh, or just slightly above reality. Great. Um, I don't want to artificially move us along too quickly. Did anyone have any? Other questions or comments for Matt on the one tens? Okay. Um, so I think uh, this is your show, Maureen. Yes, it is. Thank you very much. So um, I'd introduce myself, but we just saw each other Monday night. So <laughs> anyway, um, I'm here for the assessing, planning, and codes budget, and that is three different departments. For those of you who haven't heard this bill before. Um, the assessing department led by Clint, the code enforcement department led by Ben and planning led by me. Um, overall, the and, and we have two uh, full-time support staff people. I don't ever wanna forget to mention them. 
Uh, so the budget isn't that different from it, from what it has been in the past year. Uh, I do want to call out a few things. Um, we have uh, rolling GIS improvements funding, and it rolls because there are years where we're spending a lot more money than we normally would. Uh, and last year, uh, a large chunk of that money got rolled into this year's budget. So the, the annual allocation has been running at 11,000, but a lot of it got rolled into this year's budget. So um, it's not really a cut. The 11,000 we're asking for this year is the same amount we usually ask for. Uh, that is the, the computerized mapping system. It's for the whole town. Um, we were just able uh, this week to sign a contract to buy new aerial photos. We hadn't had any done since 2017. We're very excited about that. But that's about a $14,000 uh, item. So this number is gonna go down pretty quickly. Other things we're working on are um, just the normal data updates in the GIS, like the sewer service area map. And we did uh, some burial ground mapping work. Uh, we have to update our open space map with some new information from CELT and et cetera, et cetera. Uh, the, the other thing I wanted to point out is the miscellaneous contractual line. So that's a new line for our department. We haven't been using that much. And it has two items in it that we have typically put in the code's technical support line. So one of it is the, uh, the annual online permitting system. And the second one is the uh, Hamari short-term rental third-party enforcement. And so we're, we're carrying both of those forwards and the code enforcement line has really kind of uh, gone back to what it was originally conceived as, which is a fund for the code officer to use as needed for uh, retaining technical expertise on certain code enforcement items. So uh, unless there's any questions, I just wanna uh, let Ben and Clint see if they would like to speak. Oh, one more thing I did wanna mention. Again, uh, John has rearranged our, our capital improvement funding. And for many years, uh, I've been staffing the conservation committee and there was an account that resided in the public works budget, but funds the Greenbelt Trails account. Uh, the last couple of years, it's been funded at 19,000. Uh, this year, the Conservation Committee asked for that funding and also asked for a capital improvement fund request of $80,000 to repair uh, five high priority area Greenbelt Trails. And uh, the proposal is to change that Greenbelt Trails account that was originally $90,000 into a CIP account and to fund it this year at $40,000. So um, the, co the, the Conservation Committee Chair Mitch Waxman is here and uh, I would like him to have an, a moment to speak as well, either right now or right after Ben and Clint. Great, thanks Maureen. Before we bring Mitch in, I just, I, I meant to note before for anyone who's following along that we're on page 45 in the budget book um, for, AI, um, for the ACP um, codes. And Maureen, do you have, um, do you happen to know, I, I was just flipping through to try and find it where, the, where those C, um, CIP requests are? I actually do. I've got that tab at page 199. Great. Thank you. Um, Matt, do you mind bringing Mitch up to give an overview of that request? Should be joining us in, uh, here we go. Evening, Mitch. Hey, Mitch. Hey, everybody. Thanks for the uh, opportunity to join you this evening. So as, as Maureen sort of laid out, you know, we've put a capital improvement uh, request in front of you. Um, you know, over the last two years, we've done a pretty big study of all the Greenbelt Trails in Cape Elizabeth, trying to understand what are the highest priority areas um, that need to be addressed. Uh, the things we've come up with, and as any of you guys know, if you're trail users, we've got a huge boardwalk in Gullcrest that's reached the end of its, um, the end of its lifespan. It's about 1300 feet long. Um, replacing that is not a volunteer task. So we, that's, a, that's a pretty big allocation of our request. Um, we've also got some funding in there for Town Center Trail, uh, Cross Hill in Winnick Woods and Stonegate. You know, all of these have seen a huge amount of people out on the trails you know, regularly. And then I think as COVID came, we've seen this sort of um, refocus on people doing things in their own backyard, which is awesome. Um, but it's also 
you know, kind of brought to our attention the need to get on these projects, um, get these things fixed up. Great, and Mitch, am I remembering correctly that that, that um, boardwalk replacement, it, we had an item in the budget several years ago for redecking that. Is that what this request is as well, or is it a rebuild of the entire boardwalk? No. Oh, no. That's a, diff no? That's a different item. So okay. the, the, re the redecking you're talking about is a, a very large uh, freestanding bridge across the Spurwink Marsh. And that, that funding, I believe, is allocated we have a contractor um, lined up to do that, I believe, this spring. Um, that one's at the edge of its life, too. This is the, the outer loop trail that kind of goes all the way around the outside of the parcel. Um, it's, in, it's in tough shape. We, we Volunteer-wise, we put about 30 new boards into it uh, this fall. And just as soon as we got done with those replacements, 30, 30 additional boards uh, rotted out. <laughs> so we're chasing our tails and we need to just go for it. Any questions for Mitch um, on that? I have a question. Um, this, and your last statement really dovetail in with that. Um, has the um, Conservation Commission taken an approach to looking at all of the um, um, infrastructure pieces across all of our trail system and established an ongoing maintenance plan so we don't have maintenance events? We have. We actually cool. hired um, a contractor this past year to inventory uh, the entire trail system. They brought back to us um, information on what we have and, uh -huh. and what we need. Um, okay. So we're using that to set priorities. Uh, regarding okay. maintenance, you know, I think I think a lot of these boardwalks um, they probably last 20 years, and then the and then the materials are expired. Some mm -hmm. of the re really big stuff we have, like around uh, go, uh, Great Pond, we expect to get longer lifespan out of those. But those mm -hmm. are hundred thousand plus to put them in. So mm -hmm. I think that what we're what we're seeing is sort of um, normal, but we we have been trying to prioritize um, the highest needs in the network. Is there a way to set a establish a plan that says if we had X amount of dollars on an annual basis, we can um, stay ahead or keep things um, pretty much trued up so that you have kind of a, 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 a set amount of dollars that are spent in order to maintain? Yeah. Good. That's a really good question. You know, typically our annual budget does allow for that. And it's kind of spot replacement of things that are problematic. It's maybe addition of, a, you know, a small boardwalk here or there for a, for a location that, that shows up as a problem. But these, these larger boardwalks that we're talking about here with the capital request, our, our typical approach, I, I've been on the committee now, this is my ninth year. This seems to be our mm -hmm. typical approach that the normal budget covers um, average maintenance items. And, it's, and it seems to be sufficient to, to allow us to do that. It covers some permitting costs as well. Um, but then there's often every you know, handful of years, a big project that's, that is way outside of that budget. Um, okay. So we come to the council and, and look okay. to support us. Okay, cool, thank you. Sure. Any other questions for Mitch? Great, thanks Mitch for joining us and giving us an overview of that. I think those both sound like, you know, necessary improvements. I certainly use those trails a lot. <laughs> yeah, um, thanks. But, yeah. Thanks for uh, um, joining you this evening. Appreciate your hard work. Yeah, good to see you. Okay, likewise. Bye bye. Thanks. Um, and then I'm going to um, also go back to Maureen and ask if counselors had any questions for Maureen or uh, Ben or, or Clinton on any of the other items in the um, 120s. I have a quick um, question, and it may be more for John. Uh, the miscellaneous contractual, why aren't, can we just break it out and call it short term rental? 
because it sounds like that's going to be uh, something that's we're going to have for a long time. And it just seems like calling it short term rental would make we, we'd know what it is. We, we can call anything anything. And if the council feels better about uh, using that nomenclature, I'm fine. I can work that out. Okay, Maureen, what are your thoughts? Well, right now, only half of it is short-term rental. The other half is the online permitting. So uh, like what John said, if, the, if it is in the council's interest to very closely track expenses and revenues for short-term rentals, certainly we can work with you. But um, if we wanted to do that, we probably would move the permitting software funding back into um, the, the code's technical support line. Or I, I can I can certainly set up two separate accounts, one to track uh, the uh, short term rentals and the other to track the uh, permitting so that uh, you've got that information and it's readily available. So I can I can certainly work with Maureen to make an appropriate uh, structure. Does does that make sense, Maureen, or is it just going to create more uh, more? It, it, I think it's really up to the council while you have, I mean, since we've spent so much wonderful quality time talking about short-term rentals, I understand that <laughs> I have an interest in, in having a very clear uh, track and accounting of how much that's costing you. So if that's what you want, probably John's suggestion of having one line that's just short-term rental would be the easiest way to do that. Okay, that sounds good. I have a question um, and what I think about is that um, at what point do you think that we are going to need to um, augment staffing in our uh, codes area? I just want to have it on the horizon. And I know you guys are working really hard to make sure everything works and you never have to add um, resources or human resources. But at some point in time, we might need to have a conversation about that. Because it's a lot that's going to be absorbed into that organization. If, uh, if, if I may, uh, Councilor Gabrielson. I know uh, coming through, Ben and I had a well, we've had a conversation about this a, a few different times. I know uh, Maureen smirked when you asked the question, and uh, it's a live item. I know Ben and I talked about it as recently as what was it? Maybe last Friday, Ben, we were talking about it as well. Uh, you're probably going to see something next year's budget uh, if it, if it yeah. continues at this pace and speed, uh, unless we have some way, shape, or form to cl to clone Mr. McDougal. Uh, this. The items that are placed upon his shoulders, uh, you know, the short-term rental, the, the like, the software is a great tool that'll be there. Uh, but as you notice, on a month-to-month -month basis, looking at the numbers from our permit volume, if it continues at this pace, or if it even if it pulls back a little bit, uh, he is about as. I mean, there's a reason why he's tall and thin. It's because he's stretched in in, in every direction right now, as well mm -hmm. as the, the state is coming forward with different codes. And, and, and additional updates that, you know, you, you think about uh, from the mechanical side of it, the electrical side, uh, uh, as well as uh, multiple different lines, quite frankly, uh, plumbing, electrical alone, we could po possibly look at being creative there and, and finding someone who can provide that service to us on a contractual basis or, but it's, it's something that we're looking at I anticipate we'll be having a next in FY23's budget is uh, that's probably at that horizon just because it has been a torrid pace for two years straight and it has been leading up to that since in many ways since 07 you know after we came out of the great recession things have just grown and grown and grown and uh yeah uh, up, up here he's probably uh about as stretched as soon as you can find I mean all we do things extremely extremely efficiently here i think as far as from a staffing side of it goes but uh, on a day-to-day -day basis i think uh you know maureen ben clint deborah all of us uh try to you know wear multiple hats but sometimes it can get challenging but on the code side yeah definitely 
we're looking at next year. Okay. I just don't like to lose good resources uh, because you have expectations that are unrealistic. So um, I would rather retain a resource like Ben versus stretch him any thinner. And, and if, if, if we do run into that as well, uh, and, and we find that that's, that we have to act prior to, uh, as we had in the past as well, you know, with John, with John coming on or other, other positions that we've had, uh, if we need to come back to the council to have that conversation, we uh, may, we may have find ourselves at that crossroads as well. Just to follow up on that, um, Ben, I wonder if you could just talk a little bit about, you know, other communities that are in this in this boat. Are you aware, you know, as you as you exceed the volume of what one code enforcement officer can handle, um, how are other communities looking at expanding that level of service or ramping that up in ways that is there a model that makes the most sense to you, or what what are we looking at in in out years, or potentially even this year? <laughs> Yeah, what I discussed with Matt was potentially uh, getting a part-time inspector for electrical and mechanical. Those are two areas of codes that get more. And we're probably, we're one of the only communities that I'm aware of. We, we are the only community that I'm aware of that doesn't have a master electrician as the electrical inspector. And so to, you know, what would be nice is to find uh, a, a retired electrician or an electrician that's looking for a change of pace uh, or an electrician that is willing to not work in Cape Elizabeth, but work in other towns to become a part-time electrical and mechanical inspector. <clears throat> the state is about to adopt the International Mechanical Code to enforce. Uh, so it's another large book that's going to be on my plate to enforce uh, that, that honestly, I, I haven't been trained on it yet, but it's, uh, it's another world to get into with, with code enforcement and most other, every, every other coastal community that I'm aware of north to, uh, you know, 30 miles north all the way to Kittery has multiple inspectors, more than one code officer. So I think we might be one of the last remaining coastal communities to have a have a single code officer without uh, any assistance. Thank you. Um, any other questions on the 120s portion of the budget? Yeah, Clinton. Well, while I have all your attention, uh, I, I would like to give you a, a brief update on our reval status. Uh, I know it's been written in, in the uh, report here, but uh, I just want to let you know that uh, we are still planning on doing the reval. It was uh, part of the, the council's goal back in 2019 and the comprehensive plan. Um, darn COVID kind of uh, <laughs> kicked it to the curb for a little bit. Uh, I'm still not going out in the field this summer as much as I'd like to. Uh, vaccination is, is not, uh, you know, herd immunity is not there yet. So, um, so what, what I'm planning on doing is doing the field work in 2022. Um, and this year I'm going to be doing uh, a lot of the behind the scenes stuff. I'm going to be working with NDS who's uh, Posts are assessing database. We're going to be updating uh, cost tables and land tables and building tables, all on the training side and preparation for the reval. So, getting all that uh, kind of homework done before uh, before 2022. Um, and if you notice on the uh, on the SIP line, I still have my reval numbers there, uh, and that's going to be used for the software updates and the, and the training that NDS will do. So um, it's still coming, <laughs> it's just coming in 2022. So I just wanted to give you guys uh, an update on that. And from what I read in the paper, we'll be in good company with a reval in 21, 22, somewhere in that time frame. Yeah, well, I, I, I know sales are, are really strong. I mean, you know, our, uh, this year, I'm certifying at 76% with the state. 
that's that's down from uh, 80 last year. So um, going down means that sales are going up. So um, you know, we need to do the reval to to get everyone's exemptions back to where they should be and get equity in the town. So. Are there any other things we can do for the eval? I know in South Portland, they kind of sent these surveys to new home buyers saying, what improvements have you made to the property? And they kind of, I mean, it's honor system, but they kind of try to use that. Is there anything else we're considering since 2022 is a while off? Well, believe it or not, um, it's, it's closer than you think. Um, <laughs> And as far as the questionnaires goes, um, I do send out uh, sales questionnaires to every uh, new sale that happens. And they will tell me if, uh, you know, if, if they think they got a good deal on the sale, they'll tell me if they're, uh, you know, if they know the, the, the seller, sometimes it's a relative or, you know, so there, there's, they, we use the questionnaire to, either qualify the sale or to disqualify the sale. You know, like if you bought a house from your, your cousin and they gave you a deal, well, I don't want to include that in my sales study because you probably got a, a really good deal on it. So we'd kick that one to the curb. So yeah, we do do the sale questionnaires. They're voluntary. Um, I get maybe, I don't know, 60 or 70% of them back. So I, I do use them. Um, but yeah, as far as doing a, a town-wide questionnaire, I think it would chew up more, it would chew up too much of my time to, to, to go through them. And then you, you really need to, you really need to-, to, to It's been a long time back. since the last valuation. Yeah, we haven't done a door-to-door -door since 03. So yeah, definitely, you know, we've got to get boots on the ground. I, I've I had two, uh, two experienced uh, field listers all set up for, you know, pre-pandemic and the three of us were gonna do the town and, and get it all done in about six months. Um, I'm thinking I can still get those same two gentlemen. Uh, they were the same guys that helped canvas a town in 2003. So we're familiar with their work. They have good quality work. They worked with Matt before. I, I I've known him for years. Um, so yeah, we've got good people. Um, it's just gonna it's just gonna be in 2022. Thank you. Yep. Thanks. Any other questions? Okay. Well, thank you all um, for for joining us for that. And um, I think the next item on our agenda, we're going to go a little bit out of order and hop down to the five hundred, five tens for um, for the library. Um, Rachel, if you could give us a if you could give us a page number on that, that'd be great too. Yes, uh, page one forty two is the summary of the budget. Um, what? Well, sorry, one forty one and. Uh, then the narrative starts on 143. So um, I wanna thank uh, John and Matt for being patient with me as I made my way through my first budget here. Um, as you may or may not know, I became the director about a month before COVID <laughs> hit last year. And the budget had already been prepared by the previous director, and I had the, the task of reducing that a bit um, uh, once COVID hit, but had not gone through the whole process of preparing a budget before. Um, so um, I, uh, I did last year end up reducing a lot of uh, the lines um, so when you see a lot of increases, as I noted in the narrative, um, a lot of that is bringing it back up to where it, it would have been. Um, I cut some uh, areas of the budget last year um, because of COVID um, where I thought that the foundation could help support um, uh, those lines, uh, areas of programming and um, in our uh, 
uh, various miscellaneous supplies, um, which are, are our program supplies for the most part. Um, and the foundation has, uh, has helped us continue with that. Um, but I did want to restore those lines to close to where they should have been, or at least in part uh, where they should have been, um, because they are essential parts of, of library functioning. Um, so we managed to, through, um, through some layoffs uh, once um, this fiscal year, uh, not layoffs, uh, uh, furloughs uh, when this fiscal year started, as well as two part-time positions that uh, people moved on um, to have significant savings in our personnel budget um, this year. Uh, so by my calculations through March 1st, we've um, saved upwards of $55,000 by not filling those positions. Um, and the reason not to fill those positions was it was strategic in part to save money, um, but also in part to keep um, the number of staff down in the building. Uh, those two positions were public service positions um, and they were positions where had we hired or replaced those positions, we would have had more people in the building than would have been uh, um, advisable uh, given COVID. And so we've managed to, um, to pivot to curbside service and virtual programs. And I'm, I'm very proud of our staff for, uh, for the work that they've done and, and the consistent level of service that they've been able to maintain um, in providing complete access to our collection the collection of about 80 other libraries in the state um, through curbside service, and then our fantastic um, slate of virtual programs that um, that have have really been just taken off. Um, so we've managed to keep a minimum of staff in the building, keep them working far from each other so that they're not in each other's spaces, and still provide the service, and with a significant savings to the town. So um, in a little bit of making lemonade out of lemons, um, I took this opportunity uh, of, of having the, the building closed to the public and this reduced staff to, um, to do some reorganization. And uh, as most of you know, I've, I've been with the library now for almost 28 years. Um, I was the children's librarian uh, about 10 years ago, maybe. Uh, my position was officially retitled to assistant director slash, slash children's librarian. But I have been here a long time and uh, I know very well um, how the, the service functions and how where its um, weaknesses are. And so I've taken this opportunity to realign things a bit. And so the budget reflects that um, in terms of our personnel budget. Um, and one of the major changes is, is to stop relying on uh, substitute staff. Um, that's been, um, I think, a, uh, a problem in providing high quality and consistent service uh, to the public. Um, having somebody come in to work who is here only occasionally, who doesn't know the community or doesn't know our patrons, doesn't know our systems, um, might need to be retrained every time they come in because they have been away for so long and there's a lot of technical aspects to um, uh, and procedural aspects that aren't going to be retained and it's not going to be muscle memory for them. Um, so I feel, you know, that doing away with that whole model of, of just sort of having a warm body behind a desk rather than a um, functioning, fully functioning uh, staff person to help people on a consistent basis um, was not good for us and not good for, for the public. So, um, so realigning uh, those budgeted, um, what were budgeted as substitute hours with the two open positions and then shifting things around a bit. Uh, uh, so there's a little bit of an increase to our, our full-time line and a significant decrease to the part-time line. Uh, to um, come up with a, a staffing solution that I think will work better um, both internally and for the public overall. So that's the major, major difference there. Um, the other ones were, you know, as I said, the other increases mostly had to do with bringing things back up to where 
they would have been pre-COVID. Um, and uh, reducing some lines, um, we were able to just kind of make some strategic decisions like investing in prepaid um, envelopes for bills um, this year, which is gonna last us for quite some time. So that reduced our budget, our, our budget for postage going on. So little nitty gritty details like that. Um, and uh, sort of moving uh, some of our things from what were considered miscellaneous contract services back into printing and advertising where they should have been. So other than that, um, I think it's pretty straightforward. Our, our books and periodicals uh, and audiovisual materials are staying steady, um, which I think will serve us well. Um, so I think we'll be able to continue to, to provide the, the materials that people need. Um, interestingly, my, my last calculations, the, the cost of, of books uh, has actually decreased slightly uh, rather than increased in terms of a, a per title cost on average. So I didn't feel like there was a, a need to increase those um, materials lines. So cool. There we go. I have a question. Yes. Um, actually, it's not a question, it's probably a statement and a number one, everything you described uh, sounds fantastic. I think your staffing model makes a lot of sense. Um, and I don't know if you've had the opportunity to read the town, the town council goals, but right there in it is encouraging library programming for a variety of interests uh, uh, for uh, interests and ages. Mm -hmm. So it sounds like your staffing kind of uh, leans into that, which is good. Um, it sounds like the fact that you're now uh, uh, trying to bring programming back to the level pre-COVID. Mm -hmm. um, so um, I, I just had wanted to um, encourage you to take a look at that goal and talk with Matt and see how you can leverage that goal for us to achieve great things in uh, the next year. Definitely, thank you. Um, I want to uh, echo what Penny just said. I think it's fabulous, your goals and your organizational structure. Um, just what a great idea, Rachel. And my question is COVID supplies. It just seems to me that um, July 1st isn't that far away. And I noticed you and all the other departments have zero for COVID supplies, but it sounds like you of all departments would probably need some money in that area. Isn't that something you wanna add in or do you feel like you have uh, enough money for that? Well, I think John can speak on this a little bit. Um, I think we were not going to put a specific number in that account uh, was my understanding that the, that the reason for the COVID supplies was we had had a an anticipation of reimbursement um, in that area, and that was no longer the case. So I think it's just absorbed into our regular supply budget. Is that correct? That, that, that that, is, that's correct. I'm sorry, John. Okay, uh, we, I created the COVID supplies line last year in anticipation that uh, either the feds or the state would step up with reimbursement. Uh, there was no reimbursement for local governments under the CARES Act. There is talk about this American Rescue Act or Restoration Act uh, having money, but I haven't seen any of the particulars. Um, periodically, we do have charges being made to that line in other departments. Uh, if it comes to a point where under either the CARES Act or any subsequent act, uh, the feds say that they are willing to reimburse us. Uh, we'll pull out that information and go further. We did already file and receive $9,000 in reimbursement from FEMA for the purchase of PPE for the rescue squad. Um, Chief uh, Peter pulled information together. I worked with FEMA to uh, get it the way they wanted it. it was, uh, it's already been paid, it was paid at 100%. Uh, if the uh, feds and or the state steps up and says they're gonna have another block of money, we will research uh, whatever is available for reimbursement. 
for in the case of infrastructure, if they're looking for new projects rather than reimbursing monies that already went out, we would make whatever is necessary uh, to put together the application and bring those funds into the town. That sounds great. Okay. Any other questions about the library budget? Great job, Rachel. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Thank you very much. And thanks great. for moving me up in the agenda. I appreciate that. Oh. <laughs> no worries. No worries. We'll make the chiefs wait tonight. <laughs> <laughs> okay. uh, be, before you step away from the library, if I could just have you turn to page 211. This is the fund 46. And that the purpose of this is to make you aware of other pieces of money that are being used to support the library budget and where those funds come from and how they're being used. So uh, one of the things that I found when I got here two years ago, uh, these monies were running through the general ledger. They were running through a single account. Uh, nothing was being broken out. Nothing was being tracked. I worked with, um, with Kyle uh, to start setting this up. And Rachel has really uh, stepped forward with developing a budget to move this forward so that we can track these funds and the use of these funds. So this is informational purposes and it's also to acknowledge how much work that Rachel has done. Thank you. I would just like to say that I, I having been here for so long and having um, not had this kind of information uh, available in the past, um, I just uh, so appreciate the work that John has done in putting that together and in organizing and keeping um, everything in a way that it makes sense and is trackable. That's it's a huge help to me as well. That's what happens when you work together. That's right. Thank you, John. Yeah, and thank you for pulling that together. It's great to see all of these additional library revenue sources broken out like this. This is really helpful additional information. It's also been really gratifying to see so many gifts to the library uh, just in the this past year since I've been director. Um, the Coles, Marianne Coles Children's Book Fund and um, we had some large bequests and it's it's just been really nice to see that support among the community. All right. Well, thank you. I think we will move over to public safety now, unless there's any last questions for Rachel or John. Matt. Uh, Mr. Chairman, do you, would you like me to go through the uh, one, the rest of the 100s before we get up to the 200s? Yes, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to skip over that. Sorry, <laughs> sorry, Chief Fenton, you got to wait a little bit longer. <laughs> and the, the, if I could add one last item uh, regarding uh, uh, the great work Rachel's done and her staff at the library. Uh, you know, she and I talk almost on a daily basis, it seems, uh, just going through this and the conversation we had as we looked at, you know, through COVID, uh, I said to her, if you had one opportunity to look at restructuring uh, with, the, with all of your experience of working there, wouldn't now be a great opportunity to think about how to redefine as we come out of COVID to do this. And she's, she grabbed it with both hands and uh, so we're looking forward to, to coming out and reopening and uh, having a much better summer than we did last year. But, uh, you know, the fact that they were so nimble in, in shifting to the online programming and have had and have done huge business. I mean, from the curbside, but also the virtual programming, probably much more so than than they would have had if they were held live. So that's been a just a great, great development. If you can look at a bright spot that comes from this, this is one of them. And my hat's off to her, uh, to Rachel and her staff uh, for the work that they've done over the past year. Thank you. Great. Yes, thank you. I, I heartily echo all of that. <laughs> um, all right, Matt, you were, I think we're on 53? Yes, sir, we're on page, okay. uh, page 53, which would be uh, 130, 135. And this is town council and the legal and audit budgets. Uh, you'll notice that uh, 
the town council one is a fairly spartan line it's uh for if uh, councillors want to do some training some of the mma training or other conferences if a councillor wanted to go to the mma conference or other conferences that are available uh, there's a budget uh, for that right there and then on 135 which is legal and audit uh, you'll notice this year legal has been reduced by a, a significant amount, but that says we do not have any pending uh, legal uh, <laughs> legal issues. Uh, but if we do have our normal course of business issues versus paper streets in the past where we had it had drawn over the prior two budgets, uh, we're coming back now more to our traditional numbers as well as on the audit side, that is an increase due to uh, an, in, an increase in audit rates that we will see this year. Uh, they've been fairly flat for, for quite a long time. Matt, on the audit, um, are we anticipating with either with the um, federal funding that we received last year or with any of the anticipated grants that we've coming that we're gonna trip any of the federal audit requirements? Um, would, that, would that change our audit level at all? John, uh, I know you can answer this question. There was uh, due to our level of yes. The answer is yes. Uh, once you get uh, seven hundred and fifty thousand dollars or more in uh, federal funding, you uh, move up into the A one thirty three requirements. We're there because of the amount of money that the school department received in federal money. So we are there. Uh, and it doesn't matter if it was the town side or the school side, it is the entity and the entity is the town of. So that's why this additional $9,500 is in there to assist in offsetting the cost of the additional uh, requirements for the federal reporting and the audit requirements. Uh, I don't know what the school is doing to assist in that cost, but uh, assuming that they're not, we're going to have, because they do not pay any portion of the audit work, that's all paid for by the town side, uh, we put that full amount in on our side of the budget. Thank you, Jim. Any other questions on legal and audit expenses? All right, Matt. And uh, uh, Deborah would be next up with our elections budget, which is starting on page 56. Great, thank you very much. Good evening, everyone. Um, for the elections for this next fiscal year, we would anticipate two elections, November 21 and June 22, which would actually be the primary for the midterms. Um, we have requested or suggested an increase for election staff for their hourly rate by 2%. A couple of years ago, the council asked us to look at those uh, hourly rates and bump them up each year to recognize the good work of election staff. So we have continued to do so. Uh, an update on the uh, new machines. From what we know right now is the, I guess what will be the final lease agreement uh, for the machines, the voter tabulation machines that we have now will end June 30th. So we will have those machines through our school budget vote in June. Uh, my understanding is that shortly thereafter, a courier will be sent around to all the towns picking up the machines in preparations for the new ones. Uh, part of this budget is anticipated costs because we don't know what the machines will be um, so we don't know what the corresponding costs will be. So the best thing that we could do um, per recommendation of the Secretary of State's office is base our programming costs and costs for the machines on what we have now. Uh, so some of it are guesstimates. Um, in terms of the rentals of the machines, the lease agreements, we anticipate that we would have a total of eight machines, which is two more than we have now although we did have eight for the use in November, 2020. Um, I spoke with Matt um, and we are recommending that $10,000 from the current fiscal year 21 budget um, be carried forward to 2022 since we already have those funds earmarked. Uh, so we thought uh, if the council agrees that would be appropriate carry forward and that would be done um, later towards the end of this fiscal year. Um, 
other than that, in terms of the obviously the largest part of the budget is the staffing and um, I think we'll continue to see absentee balloting encouraged, uh, certainly through pandemic. Um, I do know that voters that had not voted absentee but did so in one or two elections in 2020, um, they really enjoyed it. Um, they found it to be a safe and convenient way. We had our beautiful uh, ballot box in the front of town hall, the drop box that people used and they really liked it. Um, a lot of people said to us, boy, had I known that this was available, I would have used it years ago. So I only see that increase in the use of that. What does that do for us staffing wise? Um, that puts us in a position to really have to have more people kind of on the front end before the election to help us with the preparation and mailing of the ballots, the ultimate receipt of the ballots, and then of course processing. Um, one thing that we're, we're doing right now, which if you ask what may be the challenges in, in elections or what have you, we're anxious to see if there will be any law changes at the state level and, and even perhaps federal. Um, last week, uh, there was a series of uh, legislative hearings that I listened to and I provided testimony to. Um, and so I just, I hope that there's not a, an overreaction, you know, to maybe what happened in 2020 for problems that actually weren't problems in Maine. I'm just kind of fearful that some of the laws that may be passed uh, for Maine at least really aren't necessary. I think one thing that COVID did show us is that Maine was actually well poised um, to do uh, the election by, you know, by absentee. We have some great laws in place, great protocols, a couple of tweaks. Yes, that would be helpful. And we hope that that happens, for instance, giving us more time to process absentees, uh, like the executive order uh, allowed during the pandemic up to seven days before, that would be very helpful. So we'll, we'll continue to track, you know, that legislation. Again, I just hope it doesn't try to address problems that we don't have, at least, you know, here in Maine. So we'll, we'll track that closely. So um, other than that, again, we look forward to the machines. It will be interesting to see if there's different technology out there. That's one of the reasons why the state didn't go with a really long-term purchase of the voter tabulation machines that we have now. They wanted to see what technology may come down the road. I'm not sure if Maine will get um, away from a voter tabulation system. Um, you know, you hear uh, not so good things about uh, these machines that, that are all electronic and don't have the paper backup uh, and so forth. So it, we're anxious for that and, and look forward to uh, what the next step in that way uh, may be. Uh, so again, other than that, we would just, you know, really track the laws to see where we're going uh, to end up uh, and then, you know, adjust adjust accordingly. Um, and just one last thing I guess I'd say is we, we've all talked about the whole election cycle during 2020 and, and really what a challenge and difficulty that has been. And I just, and I think, and I hope that uh, the voters in Maine really saw um, that we do have a good system in Maine and that they didn't have to worry and panic about some of the things that they were calling us about and that their uh, confidence still remains in elections that we're going to do our best, they're going to be fair. And, um, and I have every confidence that uh, today they're um, looking at it much more positively than they did you know, a few months ago and that we're poised to uh, really move forward and look forward to that. We look forward to working with the new uh, Secretary of State, uh, Shana Bellows. There's a Zoom uh, conference with her next week, I think, uh, that I've signed up for, look forward to seeing what her goals, you know, may be as well and how we move forward with that. So, uh, so things are looking up and um, we're, uh, we're ready to take on the challenges, so. Thanks, thanks, Deb. Um, yeah, and I guess in line with Matt's comments on the library successes this year, you know, from my perspective, the way that the elections were run here locally and in Maine this year was, you know, it was certainly something we had a lot of questions about going into, but um, from my perspective, it was a real, one of the real bright spots um, in this whole pandemic situation. So congratulations to you and your staff on that. Um, Thank you. Any questions from the council on the elections budget? Oh, 
Deb, I, I just want to say that um, you rose to the challenge, and I believe that um, you and the department really did instill uh, a sense of confidence in our voters. So thank you. You did such a good job. And it was a very challenging year across the board. Um, but my question is about the machines. Do you think two adding two will be enough? Because we went through that um, midterm election, uh, our 2018 election that was crazy. And it sounds like we're not really adding machines. We're, we're adding two more, which would actually give us another an extra line on, a, on election day. Okay. Um, and, and I think part of that is, I do think people are going to be voting by absentee for the most part. I, I really do. I, I have a feeling that those days of folks waiting in line long lines on election day, I think their patience has run out for that. And I think that they're remembering that. And again, a lot of people said, my God, the convenience, I can go home, I can look at the ballot, I can study it and get it right back to you by, you know, mail or Dropbox. So I think, you know, with a combination of the, uh, what I expect to be continual interest in voting absentee, um, I think that I think we'll be okay on election day, you know, in terms of the lines. We'll certainly monitor that. Um, but Matt and I have talked uh, many times about, we, we just really think that folks are going to uh, vote before election day. Um, so hopefully we won't, you know, see those long lines like we had before. Okay. Okay, yeah. great. Great. Thank you. Any other questions for Deb? All right, moving thank you. on. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Uh, moving on to boards and committees, Matt. So we have uh, 150 and 160, which are boards and committees and insurances. And you notice that there is, is no change there. Uh, boards and committee side, uh, the big function there is it provides the minutes secretary for the boards and committees where they, they need to have that uh, taken care of. Uh, no change for that this year. That's tracked fairly fairly strongly. Uh, as you noticed last year with things being suspended, uh, we were we were very conservative, whereas this year we're getting closer to tracking what our normal amounts have been. Uh, as far as conferences and meetings, we have a small uh, item there. If they do want to do any, I see, uh, sorry, um, MMA training online for orientation, uh, things along those lines for training. Uh, if there are projects for the planning board that they may encounter or other special projects or special committees, uh, that's also included under uh, 2081. Uh, and then uh, you'll also notice volunteer and staff appreciation uh, that we have that uh, set aside as well. Uh, that's part for uh, if we do uh, some volunteer appreciation event, as well as annually uh, we do uh, in the summertime, or at least up until this past year, we've had a, a one day where we do uh, a longevity uh, luncheon that the council has been has also been uh, invited to, but no changes on any of those items from last year to this year. And then on the insurances, you'll notice that their miscellaneous insurance uh, is going up. We anticipate a two percent increase when it comes to that. And that's our just our general liability coverage that that uh, covers uh, uh, covers our liability lines. And then. Uh, and then our self-insurance is just our, our self-insurance with the $1,000 deductible that we have there. But uh, that's the only changes that we have there. If there are any questions, I'd be happy to grab those. It was a pretty, straight, pretty straightforward. If not, I can move on to uh, item number 170 and this is employee benefits. And this, this is uh, where we have uh, Main State Retirement uh, contribution that the town matches. The police department is uh, the one uh, collective bargaining unit that does have mainstay retirement in the in the town. We also have uh, liability for those who were retired that we do also have to fund as part of that uh, budget. Uh, the next item would be our, our 401, um, 401 match that the town uh, provides for a 401 plan for retirement accounts for the, for the employees. Uh, currently it's at 7% for the 401A for uh, employees, whereas uh, uh, on the uh, non-union, sorry, for the non-union employees, uh, the public works uh, contract currently has eight uh, percent for their unit, and then uh, police are under the uh, are under the mainstay retirement. And then our health insurance, we anticipate a, a nine percent change for this year, 
at the present time, uh, which falls in line really with, with what we've seen. It's been across the board. They've been great numbers, but we do get that through Maine Municipal Employees Health Trust, and that's uh, based on our experience rating. And then the other items are, are fairly straightforward uh, that, we, that we have on there. The one item we do have is uh, uh, HR uh, professional services. And this is uh, another item that we do have for uh, the provision of uh, Linda McGill, uh, the assistance that she provides to us when it comes to the contract negotiations and other legal expenses that we have there, uh, as well as our work that we do uh, with the HR provided services through the, through the uh, school side as well. And it's partially uh, part of the salary for uh, the HR side function that they do there. And then uh, let's see, wellness program as well. That is a program that we use uh, to help promote wellness within our, within our employees, as well as we do have a, a fitness reimbursement that the town has available for employees if they, if they pursue that. I think it's $240 annually. Uh, and that's for, you know, it's part of our wellness policy that we do have out there. Matt, there's a fairly substantial decrease in the budgeted request for the Maine State required retirement contributions. Could you walk us through that? Uh, jo actually, that's a, uh, John can answer that question, do some research that he had found, uh, play some, play some well-positioned phone calls to Maine State retirement. And based on his smile, he can tell you the details as to where he, what he found, which is great. If you look back in prior years, which are not available in this report, to find that we have been over budgeting main state retirement or main public employees retirement. Uh, what I found is that the only members of the staff who are covered under main PERS are police officers. And then we pay uh, about $62,000 a year in MPERS um, benefits for retirees. When I took uh, the police earnings uh, that are covered, uh, that are, are part of Emper's coverage and the uh, retirees, I come up with a much smaller figure. If you were to take a look at uh, expenses last year, they were 158,000. The budget this year is 259,000. The budget for the current year is $100,000 more than what we spent last year. And it's just a matter of it was, it was not being uh, budgeted to, uh, to what we would expect to spend. Now, in the same respect, if you go down to health insurance, there's a 9% increase, but it's a 79, almost $80,000 increase. Again, that has to do with taking a much closer look at the cost of health insurance, what we were, are spending and what we should be budgeting. Um, the other figures are set at 2% because I just ran out of time in tracing all of these numbers. But uh, as time goes on, we will have them better refined and better budgeted. Thank you. I think we could all channel former Councillor Straw in appreciating our thanks to you for tracking down these numbers. Uh, it's my job and I like doing it. Thank you. And then the next time we do have is 180, which is our debt service. Uh, and you'll notice that uh, there is a change on the principal payment and interest payment that we have this year. And that's mostly due to the refunding that took place in the past year. Uh, but then we also have, you'll notice under the capital lease payment and increase on that side. And that's the anticipated debt service related to uh, this year's capital lease items that we have anticipated in the, on the capital side. Great, are there any other questions from counselors on any of the budget item, uh, budget areas that we just, Matt just reviewed? All right, Chief Fenton, you're up. Uh, and we're on page 73. Correct, page 73. So I'll be covering 210 police services, 215 animal control, 220, which is dispatching and 240, which is miscellaneous protections. Um, I have a pretty detailed narrative at the beginning, but uh, looking back at last year, it was, it was a big challenge. Um, it was a challenging time for everybody, uh, but oftentimes during those challenging times, you find out where people's character is. 
and I couldn't be happier than the people we have here serving the police department. Uh, they showed up day in, day out, asking, what can I do? What do you need? Who needs something? You need something with the department? Can we help another department, whether it be helping with elections or helping at the library or doing deliveries? Um, I just couldn't ask much more from the staff that we had. Um, but then uh, we also did a hard look during this time as well, due to some things that happened across the country, you know, policing is under the microscope uh, and looking at a lot of the things that are being questioned about policing, they all track back to three things, which is training, policy and supervision. Uh, so one of the things that I did is immediately embarked upon some training for officers using our new power DMS platform, which allows officers to do trainings online. So they can actually do it while they're working or sometimes they can do it off duty if they are so inclined. Uh, we pushed out an additional 33 training classes that included use of force, de-escalation, duty to intercede, uh, four different trainings on implicit bias, five on search and seizure. Um, so just got the training out there, made sure that officers were having the most up-to-date trainings available. We also did a really hard look at our policies, including our use of force report writing. Um, I actually expanded our use of force. So anytime we put hands on anybody, you do a use of force report. Uh, and still in the midst of that, we only had seven uses of force last year. Uh, five of those were actually connected to mental health calls or rescue calls, and only two were actually in the process of taking someone into custody. Um, we also did a hard look at the at remaining policy that policies, excuse me, uh, that included duty to intercede, our use of force procedures, internal affairs, recording of suspects, hate bias crimes, uh, workplace harassment. So. Final thing we're looking at here is supervision. So if you look at my budget, one of the major increases that you're gonna see here is in terms of adding that four sergeants position. Um, that was something that outgoing Chief Williams really wanted me to do in the first budget year with me as chief. Uh, but I wanted to kind of uh, reinvent that position or redo that position and redo the expectations. So much more of a mentoring role and accountability and liability uh, is, is now been placed on that position. I wanted officers to be well aware of that before I went ahead and tried to add that additional force sergeant. Um, but I think it's important right now in terms of transparency and accountability that on every shift, we have someone who's ultimately responsible. You'll also see in there that kind of dovetails into the larger SUV, which is just making sure that the equipment is being applied correctly and used when, when, uh, when appropriate and within policy. So you're ensuring when that supervisor arrives on scene that all the equipment they're expected to use and be trained up on and are required to use via our policy is also arriving on scene. Um, you'll also see in there I'm doing, uh, there's a large item in there for redoing our in-car cameras once again, Nothing more transparent than being able to record our interactions with the public, uh, which right now people really would like to see. So that is also in there. The final uh, bigger addition that you're gonna see in there as well as a message board. We're actually replacing a message board that was originally fell under the public works budget. Um, but since we've been utilizing and deploying our message board, which is kind of a speed trailer as well, I thought that maybe we should take control of this one. Um, there was a lot of calls for it, obviously through COVID, but this is a, it's a messaging board that can be used for any of the departments who might have a need for it. We could deploy it wherever need be. And then also, so it's not just sitting up at public works and not being used. We could also do a speed measurement, which especially during COVID, my calls for speed enforcement around town are, are everywhere. And there's no better uh, depiction of us responding to people's calls than an actual speed trailer that is there. So sometimes I call it my most valuable employee uh, it's out there 24 seven, but people like to see it and the, the call for it in different neighborhoods is great. So that would allow us to have a backup as well when it wasn't being utilized for the messaging that we could obviously deploy it into those neighborhoods where we have such a demand. Um, going forward, it's just trying to figure out how we're going to get back to some normalcy here. What I really would like to do is reconnect with the community. Uh, Obviously, that's where we're going to find out what the needs of the community are, and that's basically from having those opportunities that we have to go out and meet with the public and talk to the public in ways that we have been able to, unable to do for the past eight months. So I'm just hoping to reconnect and find out what people's needs are. If there's any specific questions, I can go line by line through the um, budget, or if anyone has any specific questions I can address, I'd be willing to do it. I'll pause and see if any counselors have questions. Yeah, Valerie. I have questions. Well, first of all, Chief Fenton, congratulations. Um, you've done an amazing job with all the balls you had to juggle and everything going on this year. Um, really, really amazing job. The um, fourth sergeant position sounds like a great idea. 
I'm just curious if you're going to have enough um, part time payroll with um, some of the added parking issues that we're looking at and um, Kettle Co stickers, uh, some of that. I see that your part time payroll really isn't increasing what 400 bucks. So I was just curious if that's really um, going to be enough for you with some of the added responsibilities we've been heaping on you. Yeah, it's it's obviously going to be a challenge. We're, we're pulled in a lot of places. I have what's called focus patrols areas, hot spots. We have the speeding issues that we're looking at around town. We have a very, uh, how do you put it, motivated staff. So they want to get out there and and, and fill these needs. What, I, what I'm not sure yet is exactly what those needs are gonna be. I'm kind of forecasting a little bit. I might be stretched a little thin this year, um, but then in terms of how we're gonna fill that need, first I have to get a look at what exactly we're gonna need. And then I had some talks with the manager about the possibility of doing some type of traffic enforcement, uh, excuse me, a, a parking enforcement, uh, someone who can maybe be a hybrid even with possibly looking at an, a combined ACO position. We have a position that we share with South Portland is just finding out once we have a year with these new uh, kind of expectations, then I can figure out after the how to fill them. Okay. And then um, one of your line items for gasoline, and I'm gonna talk to um, Lisa about this too. It, it looks really low to me, especially with the price of uh, fuel going up. I know that it was purchased at a, a certain price and locked in, but is that through the end of 2021 or is that our fiscal year? How, how does that lock in? Do you know? I think that's locked in for our fiscal year. We get that every year from the public works director. He actually provides that to all different departments. And we typically use about nine, 95, 9,500 gallons. And he kind of locks that price in for me at the budget year. I tell him what he's able to get, uh, the manager might be able to speak a little bit more directly to that, but it's kind of a number I basically get from the public works director. Okay, you know that. Yeah, that, yeah, that is, that's uh, that's an item that uh, historically Bob would have done. Now Jay will be doing that as well. Uh, you, you do, you try to lock in when you, when you're, for lack of a better, your crystal ball seems to show that uh, it's now is a good time uh, and you end up signing up with the different vendors who will provide that so you, you go for the best price when you can find it and, and generally lock in uh, like if it's Dennis K Burke or someone along those lines who you end up buying your fuel from but it's a yeah it's, it's a timing thing but Jay can talk about where we're at what we have for current uh, contracted price okay well kudos to you Jay I see that you're uh, <laughs> one of the attendees uh, that that's that's really great and if it is for the fiscal year then um then we're covered, but if it's just through the end of 2021, um, then these numbers might be too low is one of my concerns. Um, the other concern I have is um, the bulletproof vest replacement. Um, you were talking in here that you replace them, you wanna replace them before five years but you're only asking for one this year. And so to me that the numbers didn't add up, it sounds like you would need to replace a couple this year if you're going to replace them for all of the officers within five years. Um, it actually falls depending on when we hire them. So as those are specifically fit to each officer. So each officer is gonna get one and it's gonna be good for five and then we might hire an officer a year later. So each year it could be a different number when their expiration dates are coming up. They weren't all given at one time, kind of as they expire, we replace. So everyone being hired at a different time, it just falls on a different um, schedule as far as replacement of those. Okay, because I, I was just thinking if, if that's a line item that rolls over, it might even be easier just to, um, you know, give a little, so some years the number would be a little higher and it would roll over. Um, so that way it wouldn't look so different every year. Yep. Something just a, just, as a suggestion, because that seems um, really important. And if you're replacing it, um, you're gonna replace, some years you may be replacing three or four, it sounds like. Yes, correct, correct. Okay. And, um, so I was just thinking that didn't look like the number was high enough. Um, and then um, street lights, I, <laughs> aren't we, 
aren't we talking about the LED replacement? Um, I, I was kind of curious because we put that off last year and I saw that we don't have it in the budget this year either. So I was just wondering if that's something that we want to look at. Um, it's kind of funny for me to see it under uh, Chief Fenton's, um, under Chief Fenton there, but um, is that something we've talked about or that you've thought about? Yeah, I've had some recent conversations with Manager Sturgis as well as uh, Jay Reynolds. Those things are being looked at. I think the originally the police chief it fell under the police chief when they were removing them because it became a public safety issue as far as the removal or the reduction, excuse me, in number of them. But I just this week had a talk with Jay and I think Matt can speak a little bit more to where we are with the streetlight project. Chomp, chomping at the vet, Chief. I'm chomping at the vet here. Uh, <laughs> nice tea up. Thank, thank you, Council Deborah, for the. Uh, for the assist on that. Uh, first, uh, Jay has updated me for fiscal year 22 on the fuel. Uh, regular unleaded is at $1.88 per gallon and diesel we have locked in at $1.95. So that's for the entirety of this fiscal year. So that's, yeah, but uh, once again, Jay did a great job. So thank you for that. And uh, yeah, as the chief was saying, uh, we the LED lighting is a very live item. Uh, uh, have a meeting tomorrow with Jay and uh, CMP. Uh, what we don't, we have like 200 and some odd lights across town. And looking at the analysis to replace them, own them, maintain them, and do all that versus having CMP basically swap them out. They maintain them. They do all of the labor. We do not have a $200,000 capital expenditure on our uh, in our budget this year, but yet we have the savings from having LED lighting versus. Uh, you know the mercury vapor lighting or whatever we have so we're looking to save an estimated 18 to twenty thousand dollars on first street lighting electrical usage in the first you know year one uh, is what we're looking at so i'll have a better number for that as we go forward but uh, that's we will be converting we just won't have the ticket that'll go with with owning it nor the maintenance uh, worries about having to replace the light uh, or 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 repair lights or if god forbid someone hits a pole takes it down that we have to go and install a new light so uh, that is the goal that we're doing we're just trying to find a more uh, inexpensive way to get it done uh, that provides and or meets it meets our need but also uh, helps us on the budget side that's great that's really great okay well, thanks Chief Fenton those are my questions yeah go for it Gretchen thank you um so Chief Fenton, first of all, I just want to express my appreciation to you and the department, obviously, for everything you always do, but particularly this year. Um, it's not often that a budget narrative almost brings you to tears, but this one did for some reason. It's, um, <laughs> but that's the way this year is going, I guess, right? Um, I do have a question about the less lethal equipment. I was wondering if you could just talk a little bit about why you feel like this is the time that we need that and maybe what the training will look like around that. Um, is that yeah. distributed to... Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So there's a lot of questions, obviously, with some less lethal to use in terms of crowd control, which we don't de are dealing with here often. Um, so what I'm thinking is just having those uh, the increase in mental health calls and the severity of these mental health calls. And you're seeing it across the country of just being able to deploy any opportunity to try not to have to use lethal force, to have those options available and to have our officers trained up on it. One thing we have been lacking and that I'm planning in the midst now that everyone's been vaccinated is now that we can get back together is doing actual scenario based training. Oftentimes we get caught up in a, uh, on the web or we get caught up in a classroom that's dry and you're sitting in a chair. I'd really like to do, for example, we're doing our taser training and now I'm calling it use of force training with taser focus. But you're also learning when to deploy different things, different scenarios, who's going to be a cover officer with fatal with, with a firearm and who's going to be using the taser. What happens if the taser doesn't work? Also, always taking into consideration measurements there. Tasers are very up close, but oftentimes with mental health calls, sometimes you're staying back. You're not entering a house or someone is uh, confined to an area. So having those different operate those different uh, types of less lethal that are and once again with the deployment with the supervisor to make sure that we're utilizing the correct one in terms of distance and safety um, to just always try to bring these things to a peaceful end. That's helpful, thank you. Sure. Any other questions for Chief Fenton? Mr. Chairman, if, if I may, for just a moment, as, as Chief's wrapping up here, I just wanted to uh, 
thank the chief for his efforts this past year. I know he and I uh, spent a lot of time chatting, uh, interacting on a day-to-day -day basis through some uh, through a year like all of us will probably hopefully never experience again. And uh, couldn't be happier to have the right man, uh, right person in the job, really. Uh, uh, sometimes you say the times define a person. And uh, uh, if the definition for Chief Fenton was this past year, then uh, you couldn't ask for a better situation, really. Uh, man, the man walks a mile uh, in issues and uh, every day brings it. So thanks for that, Chief, as well, your department. You guys do a hell of a job. Really proud of you guys. Thank you, Matt. Thank you means a lot. Yeah. Can I just say one thing? Just one thing. Um, Paul, I think it's a, the statement I took away from your budget narrative that I was so um, excited to see was reimagining delivery of services. And I, I think you do that every day. Um, and I think that's what makes you so good at the job that you do. So thank you for putting that statement in there because it really uh, exemplifies who you are. Thank you. Thank you, Penny. I appreciate it. Great. Well, thank you, Chief. And yeah, Chief, I know, you know, <laughs> we've, we've commented on COVID a couple of times, and I, I, I know there were a couple of points last spring where I was sitting there thinking to myself, can we just be dealing with one existential crisis at a time here? Um, and I'm sure that thought must have crossed your mind more than once as well. So thank you for really going above and beyond this year. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you. Uh, Chief Gleason, I think we're ready for you. I don't know if I want to follow that. <laughs> Although I do appreciate Paul and we work very close together and uh, we have daily chats of all, almost a wide range of subjects, including my desire to make him spend more time with his family and less time in that chair that he's sitting in now, but I haven't been able to break him of that yet. Uh, Mr. Chairman, you just want me to hit the high points because I have five accounts to do or However you want to handle it, Chief, the floor is yours. Uh, we'll just go 225, the wet team, which is page 93. Uh, big change in that is the increase in payroll. And as Councilor Noonan can tell you, there's a lot of new folks on the wet team, which has bucked the trend of the other volunteer companies. Uh, and I did not anticipate that coming. I, I don't know if it's a COVID uh, result or what, but we've certainly increased those. So that, uh, the uh, payroll went up. And uh, the only other change in their budget essentially was radio maintenance. We, had re we have budgeted to replace a radio this year that we won't need to replace next year. So I decreased that account. Do you want me to stop after each one or just keep on going until somebody wants a question? Thank you. Um, yeah, keep going. <laughs> the fire department uh, is count 230. The only uh, significant change was the uh, we moved the admin from uh, the per diem payroll to a full-time fire department payroll. Uh, I'm very fortunate to have a full-time admin in Marianne uh, who keeps me on task and pointed in the right direction. Never realized how much, how valuable that was until I had one and now I don't want to lose it. Uh, overall, the budget stays about the same. There's some increase in payroll. Our fortunate in our per diem staffing that um, Probably half of them are firefighter paramedics, which is a great ratio, but that also means we pay more in payroll. Uh, like tonight, three of the four working are paramedics, which is great if we have a medical emergency. And then we also, there are all four are firefighters. So we base our payroll on uh, EMS license level as most of what we do is EMS. So paramedics are the, are the highest license level in the state and therefore the most expensive. And we pay a competitive wage. We are not the highest in the area, but we certainly are. We appear to be preferred. We don't have uh, trouble recruiting. I've never had to advertise for per diem staffing, and we have about 60 people that work per diem shifts here between the fire and the EMS. Um, and also, we still have the benefit of uh, the police officers are all EMTs, and as you are all aware of the uh, excellent action that Officer Benjamin and Officer Webster took in South Portland, it's just great knowing that we have those people first responding, and as Paul mentioned earlier, the mental health calls that we're going on are increasing and we're sort of the envy of some of the people that work in other departments and that we almost 
99% of the time, I have at least one, if not two police officers there with us to protect our people. Uh, really gives them a good feeling. Uh, we certainly appreciate all their efforts and we do all of their uh, hands-on EMS training for them along with our folks. Uh, we have not used a ton of money on training. We did not do any group trainings once COVID hit. So we're kind of behind the eight ball on that, but we are starting back on hands-on uh, starting in April. Um, Peter, can I ask a question? This you is can Penny. ask many questions. Cool, I got about 27 of them. But anyway, I'll start with one. Um, with a pool of 60 people, I, um, basically, I, I, do you have to um, um, guarantee any minimum hours or is it just first come, first serve? What we do is by the 15th of the month, they have to submit their availability for the next month. Okay. And then... Uh, we start with, we want at least one paramedic on every shift on the ambulance. So we schedule mm -hmm. that way. Some people work two, sometimes three times a week. Others work only two or three times a month. All depends okay. on what their availability is. So that's most of the reason why we have such high numbers of people. And there's eight shifts a day that need to be filled. So. Wow. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Um, uh, the on the ambulance, which is 231 on page 101, uh, we reduce the training. Most of our uh, call company, EMS call company, has disappeared with the per diem program. And one of the advantages to the per diems is that other departments train them. So we have had to expend less on training and we get the benefit of their knowledge. So I do send a couple of them to specialized schools that their own departments won't pay for because we still get the benefit of that. Um, and the minor equipment account was reduced because we have now have two automatic CPR devices, one on each truck. And those are a tremendous asset. It, with the staffing declining in the, in the call companies, if we have a what we call a code situation, CPR is, I don't know if, if you've ever done it, it is exhausting. And people don't tend to have heart attacks in convenient places. We usually get in a small room and we're tripping over each other, trying to swap every two minutes. And once we hook up this device, we eliminate the need of all the people in the room. And the first time we used it, we had seven paramedics on scene. Two of them, one was running the code, one was doing the medication, the other five were looking at each other because the device was doing all the work. So, and it's effective CPR and, and it, uh, the battery lasts for at least an hour. And I don't know if you're familiar, but Main EMS changed our rules so that as long as the person has a shockable rhythm, we have to continue to work that code. And we have worked them as long as an hour before. And pretty much the people are, are wasted afterwards, but the device has been great and we appreciate the support. I think we're the only department around that has them on all our ambulances. Um, like City South Portland does not have them and I volunteered them to them, but they prefer to use their 15 on shift people. So that was the biggest change there. Um, fire police was no significant change and EMA was no significant change. So, you know, I, I think we've been very fortunate this year. It's, we have not had the challenges that the police have, but the COVID has certainly made it challenging for our people and very few people have backed away from that challenge. Uh, it is, tiresome to put on all that personal protective equipment every time you go on a call, but it is definitely needed. And we're about 85% vaccinated. There are, you know, people for whatever reason declined the vaccination. We were very fortunate Scarborough, Poland and uh, Gorham fire departments were tremendously flexible in getting all our people that wanted a vaccine vaccinated. Uh, it was a great relief to a lot of providers and, you know, we've been able to I think we've only had one person out because of an actual COVID illness. We've had some exposures, but we've had only one case of COVID in a year. So given the number of calls we do in EMS and fire, that's been ter terrific. Questions for me? I went fast. I know you, you, I appreciate all that you guys do, and I don't want to keep you up all night either. I have a general overall question only because, um, we constantly need to be thinking about how we provide um, rescue fire services. 
Would you say if we look at the uh, characteristics and the demographics of uh, Cape Elizabeth, that the um, the um, per diem model is what is considered most uh, effective um, and from a cost as well as a uh, delivery of services perspective? I, I think right now it, it is the most cost effective way of delivering it, Penny. I think looking down the road, we need, we're going to need to look at staffing full-time people. Uh, it just, the challenge we have is if you look at the number of paramedics in the greater Portland area, it's limited and SMCC's class sizes are shrinking and there are primarily mm -hmm. our feeder for paramedics. The other thing is, you know, I, I can quote that we have 60 people working per diem here, but of those 60, probably 45 of them work other places. So either mm -hmm. South Portland claims them or Scarborough claims them or Gorham claims them also. So the, the numbers aren't, aren't true is what's available for staffing. And by standard, we need six people on the fire ground to initiate a fire attack. Mm -hmm. And we can only guarantee four at this point. We're still relying on others to arrive. And most of the time that has worked out well. It could be a, a timing issue and it could be critical at some point. But, you mm -hmm. know, I, I presented a staffing plan to the manager. And I think, you know, as we go further down the road, we need at least one full-time person of our own to be accountable to run the shift and expand that as necessary. I, I think the per diem pro program at some point isn't going to be sustainable anymore, Penny. I just don't know whether that's two years down the road or five years yeah. down the road. So what would your what would your ideal staffing be, staffing model be? I, I think we, if we had six people on 24 hours a day, we could handle high 90% of what we encounter. Uh, if you be... look at years past, we were asking cell phone for a paramedic six, eight times a month. And so far in this budget year, we've uh, had to have a cell phone paramedic respond once. So mm -hmm. there's certainly mm -hmm. benefits to our system at this point. I just don't know how sustainable it is. But uh, how many full-time people do you think it would be? I, I think we should continue with a mix as long as we can, Penny. So if it's one or two per shift until that we start seeing declines in per diems, and as we need to increase it. But I think I'd like to have at least one person on each shift to be the person in charge and, and be, they also it gives us the ability to force people. Mm -hmm. Right now, if somebody doesn't want to work a shift, we don't have the ability to make anybody work, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which is, you know. Well, eventually when you get a, uh, a fewer uh, resources in the pool, they can uh, also start um, um, setting the price. Yes. Yeah. And, and, and certainly, you know, I, I think if you ask other departments, we're one of the more desirable to work for, you know, based on our call volume, our working conditions, our awesome bedrooms, um, <laughs> which people, I mean, it's like a hotel and, and people sleep very well there. But, you know, it is very comforting for me when I go to bed at night to know there's four people here. Mm hmm not sitting there wondering if somebody's going to get up and go. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I just think if we can go to six penny, that gives us, you know, a full, fully staffed engine, a fully staffed ambulance 24 mm seven. -hmm. The challenge will be adding two bedrooms to this facility at some point. Maybe we could use an Airbnb short-term rentals or something. Yeah. I'm not going down that path. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> I, don't, I don't want Ben <laughs> writing me up. Just a thought. <laughs> Is there? Are you proposing an amendment, Councillor Jordan? <laughs> yeah, yeah. If you are a per diem, you can. <laughs> Just don't put them in on the first floor. Um, um, <laughs> John, um, I was wondering too if you could um, walk us through. I know there've been some changes to the account, the way that the um, ambulance accounts um, and the, the revenues and expenses have been handled over prior years. I believe that's reflected in lines 3998 and 3999, but I wonder if you could, there was a special revenues account for rescue at some point. Could you walk us through that? Right. At a high level? Sure. Uh, it, it was fund 75. And it finished last year with an $862,000 fund deficit. Um, and so what we agreed to do was to fund that deficit 
over three years. Uh, first two years at 300,000 and the third year at the balance 262,000. And then move um, the expenses and the revenue, the operating expenses and operating revenues into the general fund, which is this department 231. So that uh, on the revenue side, we anticipate gross revenues from billings of 600,000, but uh, billing adjustments of half that amount. So net revenues to support the, the uh, rescue side is about 300,000, whereas the budget is 605,000. So in terms of revenues, um, we're only producing revenues that equal about half. Now, the reason for that is first of all, a lot of the ambulance revenues comes from Medicare, which Congress sets the amount. We can say it's worth a dollar and Congress says it's worth 20 cents and all you're gonna get paid is 20 cents. We did increase the private costs um, and we also um, uh, closed our contract with Blue Cross and Blue Shield. The contract we had with Blue Cross and Blue Shield set the reimbursement rates at the Medicare rates. Uh, we sent a notice of termination last August. I think it was a 30 or a 60 day notice, uh, but we don't get sufficient amount in private ambulance calls to really jack up our revenue stream. But we're taking um, as many steps as we can to improve that revenue stream. Um, in uh, this next year, in two years, we will have wiped out the deficit that was built up in the, ref the rescue fund, at which point that becomes a savings to the taxpayer of about $300,000 a year. Great. Thank you for walking us through that. I appreciate the overview. That was something I always found horribly confusing. And I think it's starting to, the way that it's working now, it makes a lot more sense to me. <laughs> oh, it's very simple. Just give me a call. I'm happy to explain it again. I think one of the things too, Mr. Chairman, that uh, we do well at is our collection rate is one of the highest. Uh, we do well into the 90 percentile, which is you know, my compatriots are jealous of that, but unfortunately, as John pointed out, you know, we get most of our reimbursement is at the main care rate, which does not generally cover our costs, but we do collect well. Uh, well, thank you. Are there any other questions from counselors for either for John or, or Chief Gleason? Mr. Chairman, if I could... Uh jump in editorial last room as well for Chief Gleason and I, I uh, don't let his humbleness uh, uh, throw you off at all. He's done a tremendous job as well with his department this past year. Then, uh, you know, public safety and public works have, uh, you know, they've carried on as if this was, as, as if we were COVID free. Uh, that's roughly tongue in cheek by saying that, but they've been day in and day out uh, here providing a high level of service uh, very professional side of it. And uh, to Councilor Jordan's comment regarding about uh, the per diems, uh, there's a reason why people like to come out to Cape Elizabeth and work uh, work those shifts. Uh, and Chief Gleason is a, is a very large part of that reason uh, because uh, his people do think extremely highly of him as well as I do, obviously you can tell, but uh, he's done a tremendous work for us and should be very proud of the service that he's done. And uh, I know, uh, you know he brings a lot of different cre creative thoughts to the table. Uh, that help us on a day-to-day -day basis, as well as uh, you know, uh, cares for for all of his different department heads. But uh, really, really, just had has had a great year uh, for that, and uh, grateful for his service. And the way uh, I, I, I'll sum it up by saying, uh, one of the comments he made to me early uh, in our careers together was, uh, "That's that's what we do," and uh, that kind of defines the fire service, but it also defines Chief Gleason. So, thanks, Chief. Thank you, Matt. Uh, do you want me to speak, Jeremy, to the uh, capital item while we're here? Yes, or... please, if you could, that'd be great. Yeah, then we don't have to bring capital it Capital item. <laughs> As the manager has pointed out to me many times, I am the largest piece of the capital budget. <laughs> um, 
and I, and I appreciate that notoriety. Uh, we are looking to replace engine two, which is a 1999 pumper. Uh, our two pumpers, one is a 1999, one is a 2004. Uh, they originally were purchased with the idea of 25 year life cycle. I think as I point out to the manager, we're more at a 20 year life cycle. And so engine two is certainly beyond that. Uh, and engine one is not far behind. Uh, we're looking to replace it with a, a smaller, more efficient truck. Uh, together with the, the ladder truck, we think we'll, we have a good combination. I just think it's time. Uh, we we'll put about twelve, fourteen thousand dollars into engine two and maintenance costs this year. It's just like a person; the valves wear out, so we we'll replace a lot of the uh, valves in the pumping system. Uh, so I certainly think it's time. And the unfortunate things with fire trucks is they go up rapidly. Uh, they go up anywhere from eight to 15% a year, depending. And when we bought the ladder truck, we were extremely fortunate that the tariffs went into effect after we had signed the contract because the price of the truck went up by $45,000 in a month. So I, I just think with the, with the financing options available and the need for us to keep, so we don't back up all the trucks at once and then you'll have a, there'll be a lot of heartburn about replacing two or three trucks at a time like the city of Portland's trying to do. And, they're going after three for 2.7 million. So I feel pretty good about the 630,000. Chief, this is, I guess, not really a budgeting question, but just out of curiosity, um, is there any remaining life in, in the vehicle that we're replacing that might be useful to another community? We, right now we, we have uh, an older, a 1995 truck that we use as our spare truck in order to keep our pumping capacity at where it needs to be. So engine two will then take the place of what is engine three to be the spare truck for a couple of years. And we'll continue, we'll, we should be able to get another two or three years of our use out of it as a spare. But okay. if, if one of the other trucks goes down, we, we need to be able to replace it to maintain our capacity. That makes sense. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, any other questions for Chief Gleason? I, I have a question for John, but first, um, Chief, I just want to thank you for running everything so smoothly. You take care of quite a few departments, and um, it's all run so smoothly that we don't even hear about it. So I have to say thank you for handling everything so well. Um, we really appreciate you. And I'm just curious, um, John, about the, the fire engine. We're looking at seven to eight um, uh, big ticket items, be a police cruiser, van, dump trucks, lots of things this year. And um, I'm just curious what kind of financing we're looking at and how that's all gonna work. Well, the, uh, the cruisers are not gonna be financed because they've got a short life and they're pretty well used. So they're not gonna be financed. Uh, there is a list of items that are gonna be financed. We're looking at doing, again, a lease purchase. Um, I use an estimate, a high estimate of two and a half percent. The school just went out to bid on the purchase of a $105,000 school bus, and they got a rate of 1.5. I would not, you know, between now and next fall, uh, I have no idea where the rates are gonna go. Uh, there, the um, Federal Reserve is starting to at least discuss the potential of inflationary pressure as the stimulus money comes into the economy, the lack of purchasing, the pent up demand, and uh, that may put pressure on prices. Uh, as was noted about the, uh, the tariffs uh, a couple of years ago, uh, whether they stay in place or if they go away, if they stay in place, prices are not going to go down. Um, if the tariffs come off, then the prices should go down. So for uh, to be conservative, I used a figure of two and a half percent level principal and in interest. Um, off the top of my head, I think we budgeted about Two hundred and thirty-seven thousand each year for five years for to cover all of this equipment that we're looking at purchasing. Um, so that that is it, it, it's uh, 
a million one sixty or a million sixty two thousand in borrowing uh, that we're we're estimating for this current budget cycle. Uh, last year it was a million thirty five thousand, and we got that uh, at uh, one ninety eight. Matthew, was that at one ninety eight? Um, yeah, so, yes, exactly. Just under two, one point nine eight. Yeah. So the the market is very good right now on those financing using lease purchase instead of a general obligation bond is a much cheaper way of making those purchases. Um, so that's that's what we're looking at doing, and um, I, I think we're going to be in in good shape. Uh, the town's credit is at the highest credit rate that it can get given its size. If we were larger, we'd be a triple A because of our size at 9,000 9, people, we're a double A, but we're the highest uh, that we can be at. So um, the markets like us, the banks like us, the uh, financing centers like us, the credit agencies like us, we're just so likable that everybody likes us and they just want to give us their money. All right. Thanks, John. Sure. All right. If there's no other questions for Chief Gleason, I think we'll move on to the last few um, lines that we've got for tonight. And those look like they've all got Matt's name next to them. <laughs> yes, indeed they do, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> Thank you for that. Thanks, Chief. Uh, our next item we have is item number 410, which is on, starting on page 137, and this would be for the social service agencies and the donations that the town makes uh, to, to these different organizations. And one big change we had from last year was increasing the donation to Opportunity Alliance. They were overjoyed uh, with that increase to 6,500. Additionally, in, the, in, in relation to the fact that uh, they're our contractor for our general assistance uh, uh, management as well. So they, they appreciated the, all the support that the town has uh, provided as well. And then you'll notice that general assistance again is uh, is being forecast at $100,000. It's not a change from last year, but uh, we we hope uh, to not to use that all, but uh, realistically it's important to make sure that it's adequately funded in order to support uh, the needs that, of folks who do run into challenges th throughout the course of the year. But uh, otherwise, there we don't do not have any changes on this year's budget on the human services side. I have had contact with a couple of different agencies who provide those services, and they have expressed their gratitude and uh, and pleasure to, to hear the fact that they're also included again this year. So uh, they've been they've been happy with that, and that's a good opportunity for the town. So I'm happy to answer any questions on that. I'll move on to item number five twenty. Okay, the next one we'll have will be 520 and this is contributions. And this has a couple of different areas that uh, the town uh, pays attention to. We've got uh, the two big ones we have this year are Family Fund Day and the Senior Tax Relief Program. Uh, Family Fund Day, uh, we've reduced the amount uh, for that at $12,000. Part of that is uh, the Family Fund Day will not be happening this year as well due to the concerns regarding COVID. Uh, however, uh, we do have funds in the current budget that we will carry forward uh, from this year's budget into next year's budget to keep them at their regular funding and hopefully uh, come back with a spectacular family fund day in 2022. And then senior tax relief, you'll notice that this year uh, our current budget amount was $85,000 and that was due to the 75 we had with the 10 remaining that we had carried forward to fund it at 85. Uh, this year we spent 90,000, uh, roughly 90,200 to provide that benefit to seniors. This was year three of the program. So we think that's uh, at funding at $102,000 uh, should come, should cover the cost for the program. Uh, now we have really stabilized numbers and uh, with a bit of a benefit uh, buffer in between our actual and where we may be. So that does provide the uh, the cushion from what uh, we'll need to have, but it's been extremely well subscribed, which is great because that's the desire to, have. when you have a program like, like that, you want your residents to be able to take advantage of it. And they have, and Clint Sweat has done a tremendous job uh, getting the word out and working with people and helping them process uh, those applications. So that's been a, a really a big success for the town. So happy to take any questions on those two items. 
and looking at the next one, which is 530, which is public information. And this is a, a funding that we do have for our uh, communications side uh, for, for the budget. Um, Part-time payroll this year is down uh, a bit. Uh, obviously, we're, we're, gonna, we're looking to carry forward some of our funds from this year into next year's budget. Uh, that's, that would be our television. When, when we do get back into the council chambers and have part-time help in there to, to help run the, the TV, CETV, uh, we'll use that funding to, to, to staff that position. And then we do have our webmasters uh, position in there as well. And uh, Susanna, who's on here with us, I think tonight, may still be here with us. Yes, awesome. She does tremendous, a tremendous job for us. Uh, she stepped into a huge, uh, a, a huge position where Wendy Derzwick had, had been our, our one and only webmaster for forever. They worked together for a lot of last summer. And this, my, by the way, was during the height of COVID. And uh, Susanna came up to speed and has not missed a beat as well as helped uh, implement uh, the introduction of our new website on the town at the town's website. So she's been a great addition to the team and uh, gets our stories out and uh, is just great to work with. So we're happy to have her. So we've got the funding for that position there as well. And then uh, other, other maintenance issues that we do have related to our um, providing our, 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 our communications. Um, one item that Councilor Gabrielson and I had spoken about uh, midstream of this year was uh, looking at communications or the ability to, to do more communications on a, that's great. That, that shows why we need to have a communications person. We need to do more communications better. That was well spoken. But <laughs> uh, case in point, uh, one of the regional efforts that I took part in a GP COG meeting recently, and we were talking about, uh, about the communities or multiple communities who do not have a person who, who does that full time. At least GP COG may be providing that service, or we may try to find a regional approach to, to providing those types of services. So as those conversations go forward, I may come back to that. We may see it in next year's budget uh, or, or later on in the year. So but, uh, there, is, there is a desire there to find a way to get messaging out uh, more clearly uh, that all towns and departments could find uh, better ways to, to deploy our information. So happy to take any questions on those two items. If not, I'll consider, oh, there's Valerie, hi there. <laughs> We thought you were getting away without a no, question. I'm fine. Thank you. Ah, on contributions, I was just thinking about the Maine Bicentennial Committee and how um, Maine has um, kicked over the Bicentennial. Is that something that we would set up as a contribution if we did something for the Bicentennial or where would that be? Uh, remember back earlier, we were talking about special committees and, st and studies. I, I think we have $6,500 $6, in there. We'd probably use some of those funds or in that in that area that we had earlier uh, discussed. Okay. Okay. And I think we'd be able to find some funding there. Okay. Okay, good. Yeah. And I know that the um, Civil Rights Committee has some ideas too that they're going to be presenting um, for a 21 day challenge and different things. So I was just curious where um, those funds would be. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, probably in the earlier, in those we had two allied items earlier that uh, we looked at and we would use those funds to, to help in all, in all those areas. All right, great, thanks. Thanks for the question, that's, that's awesome. And next item we have is 709 and 710, which is uh, 709 is our interfund transfers and 710 is our intergovernmental assessments. And uh, John, if you'd like to tee up on the interfund transfers, you, I know you can explain this better than, than I do. All right, so um, I created this, uh, this department so you can actually see uh, where you're transferring funds to, what funds are being supported. Uh, before I got here, these were in various places, uh, some were in 640, some were in 520, and they were just uh, all over the place. Uh, if you start, the first one is 300,000 going to the rescue fund. Again, as I said, the rescue fund ended up with an $862,000 fund deficit. We put $300,000 in the current year budget, fiscal 21, 300,000 in fiscal 22, and in fiscal 23, there'll be uh, 262,000, which will wipe out that deficit. <clears throat> uh, the Money going to land acquisition fund, 32,914,000. Uh, there was only 16,457. 
in the current year due to an error that was made in last year's budget, but it's been restored to what it should be the proper amount. And then $10,000 going into the turf fund for that 10 year buildup of money to replace the turf field at some future date. Hey, Jeremy, I have a quick question. Yeah. Um, John, with your mention of the turf field and the turf fund, um, was anything ever done to formally engage um, some of the booster groups on that? Uh, I know we talked a lot about that last year, and it was something that you know we had said on the go forward plan for saving for the next 12 to 15 years out. Um, we'd lay some groundwork for um, you know, kind of have any expectation that that some of those groups might um, plan for that more accordingly and, and and kick in on that. So if that hasn't been done, and I think we should try and figure out how to how to best do that. That may be. Uh, something I that don't I can believe anything. Yeah, I was gonna say that. I don't think as John okay. was starting to say too. That it hasn't. Uh, nothing's really gone forward on that side of it yet, but uh, it was a conversation that I can have with uh, Superintendent Wolf from another. Yeah, and I know that uh, I know that this year, almost all of the fundraising for the different booster groups hasn't happened. Um, you know, they haven't had the same operating costs um, uh, that they've been trying to meet and, you know, the same opportunity to do fundraising. So I, I'm not concerned that nothing's happened yet, but I, I, what I don't want to happen is 10 years from now, when all of us are no longer focused on, on this work or these jobs and these seats, um, that that be something that jumps up on people again. So I, I think it was an important discussion that we had last year at this time, and that people who um, you know came around to supporting the replacement cost last year, you know, had an expectation that going forward, um, you know, we'd we'd have a more um, you know all hands on deck approach. So. No, I think that's a great point to come back to, Jamie, for sure. And yeah. uh, happy to pursue that further. And then, there's, you know, and, and the other part is just want to make sure I haven't had a chance to go through the school budget as none of us have had the opportunity yet, but to make sure that they also pay attention to, to funding reserve for replacement in their budget as well, because uh, it's important to do that. We will have, you know, we anticipate a longer life uh, surface, but at the same time, you need to pay pay that forward so we don't have to come back to that. So I think that's a great point as well. Great, thanks. And then the last thing we had was intergovernmental assessments, which is number 710. And this has uh, uh, the county government. So we have our county tax bill that's in there. You'll notice that that was increased uh, 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 somewhat. And that's based solely on uh, what the county spending is, net spending is. And then it's uh, they establish a rate, and it's uh, based on our state valuation. So they then they do their assessment to us. Uh, Council of Governments, you'll notice that is our uh, our annual fee that they had uh, for our membership in Greater Portland Council of Governments, and then Maine Municipal Association uh, our, our our dues as well for our participation at MMA, and then uh, overlay and abatement expenses. This would be the amount that is the difference between uh, well, ultimately comes down to rounding on the tax rate. Uh, and it's an amount that's between, uh, it can be up to 5% greater than the uh, level of expense. That's fairly conservative in a town of 1.01 and three quarter billion in value, but it, it does, if you do need to have that for, uh, to offset abatements that do take place, that, that would come out of that fund as well. Uh, what is remaining uh, falls to the unassigned fund balance on an annual basis. And that's pretty much everything we have for this evening. Great, thank you, Matt. Um, and I, before I just uh, ask if any counselors have questions on anything that we've covered tonight, I just wanna, I was a little flip earlier, um, but uh, I, I just wanna make sure and really express thanks to John Q for all the work that's gone into this um, in terms of helping to make this budget so much more readable and transparent. And, um, you know, I think the, the fund, the intertron fund transfer line that we just looked at is a, a great example, um, as well as obviously helping us to continue to find 
um, savings and efficiencies. Um, just thank you for all your work, John. Thank you very much. Are there any questions that counselors have on anything that we've covered tonight um, at, at any point so far up to now, or um, are we ready to say see you on Thursday? Okay, great. So as a reminder, we have um, our next workshop on Thursday night and we'll be going over the remaining uh, municipal funds that night, uh, which includes among other things, public works, facilities uh, and community services and the CIP. So we'll see you all back here then at six. Do we need a motion to adjourn? Hope you're good, Mr. Chairman. Okay, awesome. Have a good evening, everybody. Thank you, everybody. Take good care. Night.